All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll uh, call this meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have quorum? Yes, we do. The first thing I'm going to do is call for disclosures of pecuniary interest. Councillor Bowman. I, Ryan Bowman, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number 15-131, 15-132, 15-133, and 15-134. As an employee of Utilities Kingston, it may be perceived that I have a pecuniary interest in these matters. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other disclosures of pecuniary interest? Councillor Hutchison. Uh, I wasn't um, aware we'd be declaring them tonight, but um, I had two conflicts with two lines in the community services budget. The clerk has them. One has to do with uh, how's it rental supplement because my it's received by my employer, and the other is got to do with a program with Ontario Works supplied by my spouse's um, workplace. Thank okay. you. Um, Mr. Clerk, we can get the details on exactly what those two items are? Sure. Yes, we can. Just one minute, please. Your Worship, we are aware of the conflict. We're just uh, working to finalize the details, but Councillor uh, Hutchison's declaration works for tonight. Okay, thank you. Are there any other disclosures? Uh, Councillor Stroud. Uh, as a thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, as a member of the Ontario Nurses Association, I uh, uh, was wondering if, and I might need some advice from staff on this, whether I need to declare on matters uh, for the Rideau Crest home as they do employ registered nurses from a different local. So, so that's not something that, uh, that staff can rule on. That's something that you need to come to a determination uh, on your own. So what I would suggest is that if you want to seek legal advice or if you want to make a decision on that, that we'll give you an opportunity to make that declaration uh, tomorrow because we're not actually going to go through community services budget tonight. Is there anybody Thank else you. that wishes to declare pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to confirmation of the minutes. It's moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that the minutes of Committee of the Whole meeting number 2013-02 held Monday, November 25th, 2013, and Tuesday, November 26th, 2013 be confirmed. Please vote. And that carries. We have no delegations this evening, so we will move to item five, which is the 2015 budget introduction. So I'll call on our CEO, Mr. Gerard Hunt, for that. The other thing I'll let council know is that we are going to be continuing a tradition that uh, started, I guess, a number of years ago, where we give uh, a special prize to the uh, senior staff that has the shortest presentation. So uh, I know it's going to be a cutthroat competition this time, so, uh, so we will be keeping track and uh, we'll be having a, a special award ceremony when all of this is done. So uh, obviously we want to make sure that we allow time to go through the details, but also want to allow lots of time for questions. So that's CAO Hunt. Thank you, uh, Mayor Patterson, uh, members of council. Uh, before I start into the information, I would like to be excluded from the sh uh, briefness of the presentation <laughs> simply because... So you have uh, no chance of winning, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I would have a chance of winning because this is going to be the shortest budget presentation in 16 years that you've ever seen from me. So uh, anyway, uh, I really do want to uh, just uh, open up the uh, presentation uh, tonight and uh, indicate to you the... Uh, the work that's gone on, um, certainly welcome uh, members of the public and the media and others uh, with us tonight and to thank all of the staff that's in the room, both from Utilities Kingston and the City of Kingston and particularly the finance uh, team for the work that goes into this. Um, 
The, uh, the ability to put together an integrated financial plan with a 15-year uh, uh, capital budget with future projections uh, is very much in line with the direction of council uh, that was passed in September 2013 where they asked to go through all of the master plans and put all of the projects in and bring us back a capital plan, a comprehensive capital plan, and I can tell you that that is what's before you. Our practice here as we get better and better at it every year is to uh, do strategic planning, uh, make budgets part of strategic planning so that when we get to budget time, we're not spending a lot of time on detail, but more time on actually producing a budget within the targets that Council have set and delivering services uh, so that we can uh, uh, build quality of life for our community. So just a couple of things to help to uh, build uh, uh, the background to these budgets. So. I don't want to show this tonight, but at the orientation session, you all received a video link as part of your package of orientation on the City of Ryde, which was a community uh, in Australia. This link is here, and you will get copies of uh, this uh, presentation tomorrow night. Uh, but this link is here to remind you that, you know, city services started out as being uh, a certain a uh, number of services and it has grown and grown and grown and grown and uh, continues to grow and uh, and it is always a challenge to find the dollars available to fund all of those service demands. So that's the bottom line and uh, I know some of the new councillors have commented about the uh, value of that particular presentation in trying to get their minds around in the early days of what running a municipality was all about. The community plan, which is the sustainable uh, Kingston plan, the vision for our community to be Canada's most sustainable city, was, in, was managed through the process by Focus Kingston a number of years ago and is very much the goal of the city. And obviously you have seen these four pillars before and those are the lens through which we try to bring quality of life to our community. Um, you saw this at the orientation session where that uh, community vision uh, lined up with the priorities for council's term, creates the strategic plan for the corporation to be able to deliver on those priorities. That then informs the departmental plans, the departmental budgets, and it concludes with annual reporting. To achieve sustainable growth, there's a number of things that have been initiated in the last uh, few years that we're proud of and we want to continue to advance. I'll call them continuous improvement uh, processes, but they're listed here and they're in the executive summary of the report. Streamlining applications and processes for development related services as endorsed by Council from the recommendations of the Mayor's Task Force from 2012. Enhancing customer service. Updating the city's official plan on the consolidation of zoning policies and bylaws. Servicing employment land in order to be ready for new business and business growth. Reviewing our employment industrial land strategies. Fostering entrepreneurship and innovation. And this is something that we've been working with, uh, with Queens and others uh, on. And delivering an immigration slash migration strategy. And that is in this budget. Now, how do, we, how do we build the financial plans? How do we get the information in? It's not something that just comes out of the air. It actually is all part and parcel of the master plans that have been developed, including the asset management plans and the reinvestment plans that are all part and parcel of the way we run and make decisions on our assets. These are a list of all of the plans that have been completed and are foundational to what's in the budget and the long-term 15-year plan. And it is not a full and complete list, but it is representative of the major work that informs it. The major projects that are in the budget is the Cataraqui Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is a, um, a plant that's required to accommodate growth. Mr. Keach will talk about that. It's an $80 million uh, plant and it'll take about four years to construct. Reconstruction of John Connor Boulevard from two to four lanes from Sir John A. Macdonald through to Princess Street with a bridge over the CN tracks. That will take 
four to five years to construct. So we, we need to get the approval in order to get going with the project, but it will spend money over time. And the widening of Highway 15 from four lanes, uh, uh, two four lanes from Highway 2 to Gore Road. I wanted to just draw your attention to the slide. I don't expect you to read it, but it is uh, in uh, pen exhibit one, or exhibit A, part four, if you wanted to turn to it in the report. There's a couple of things that I would just like to reference in that. You can see that our, our departments work together to be able to help each other to get increases into the priority areas that council have set. So there are a number of departments that actually are, have reductions in budget this year. That money is then used to transfer over to cause other departments to have increases more than the rate of inflation. So I'm very proud of that because that means that when the treasurer says go and that the inflation rate calculation should be in the neighborhood of 2%, it doesn't mean everybody adds 2% to every line in their accounts. It means that we do strategic thinking around the budget so that we can actually look at the budget as a whole. So to staff, thank you. That is part of the philosophy of the way we operate. So anything that's in a negative in that 2015 variance column as a percentage means that that budget is going down from the base of the previous year. And the most significant part of that is this slide here, because at the bottom of that sheet, it describes what the future estimates or forecasts for all departments are, provided your provided inflation's at 2%, an additional 1% for capital, uh, some continual growth in certain service areas, predict, particularly transit, and, and about three quarters of 1% in assessment growth. And so what that means is that at your strategic planning session, if you said to us that we want you to hold the tax limit at 2.5% for 16, 17, and 18, we can tell you right now that we would have to find either additional revenues or net savings in the amounts that are on the right-hand side of this, of this chart. Now that has been a practice that's been very uh, useful to us because it allows us to focus on finding those efficiencies and solutions throughout the year so that when we come back to your budget in the next year, we've already done the work to get you to the tax level that's palatable. If your direction was to go below 2.5%, then that number on the right-hand side would increase. Just remember that in all of the discussions that we talk about here, 1% is equal to about $2 million. 1% is about $2 million. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jim and, uh, and ask him to, uh, uh, to come up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Keach. Good evening. Um, as a bit of an aside, if I thought Gerard was going to have taken a little bit longer, I would have actually driven back to my office in John Connor Boulevard because um, when the mayor made the comment about continuing with the former mayor's award for the shortest presentation, I realized that I actually won the award last year. <laughs> but in light of the presentation that I'm about to give, I really should turn it over because the only thing I, am guarantee, I will guarantee you on tonight is that I will not be winning the award when these budget presentations are done. Um, I say that because um, as, I, uh, as I go into the first presentation, and I think Council is aware I'm actually going to be doing two presentations tonight, one related to Utilities Kingston and one related to Public Works. And both of them will look at operating budgets for 2015. And both of them will look at capital budgets for the next four years for the term of council. 
And one of the things that we, and I, I say collectively, we, us at, at, at Utilities Kingston and, um, and those in public works, and I, and I think um, uh, the city as a whole, have tried to do when we look at these budgets is really bring them together and integrate them um, from a number of different aspects, particularly if you look at roads projects, um, utility work, um, the city work, and even things such as, uh, as working towards development. Um, so as a result of that, uh, for the first presentation that I'm going to do here, and I'm, I'm going to apologize right off the start, it's going to be relatively lengthy. The good part of it is the second presentation will be quite short. And I'm, I've set it up this way because the first thing I'm going to talk about, as is indicated on the slide here, is the multi-year infrastructure program or plan um, that, uh, that we are presenting here this evening um, and talk a little bit about what we have done over the last couple of terms of council. After that, I'm going to go through the, uh, the UK uh, budget as what you would expect, but um, um, I, I think it is important that I cover this off first and it is going to um, get into some of the public works projects because as I said at the start, a number of these projects are very integrated. Um, you know, one of the projects that we'll talk about is the next phase of Princess Street. And you know, if, if you go um, on the site when the work is happening, it's very difficult to tell is that a city project or a UK project. And I think there's great value to the city as a result of that. So I want to start off by going through a number of slides to really provide information and to educate council in regards to how we come up with the integrated um, uh, capital infrastructure plan. And I've talked a lot about, um, you know, to this point, about the roads projects. It's not just the roads projects. It's all of the, uh, all of the capital infrastructure projects that we are going to be looking at over the next four years at, uh, at Utilities Kingston. Uh, Gerard mentioned the uh, sewage treatment plant upgrade, uh, number of pumping stations and whatnot from the uh, sewage infrastructure structure perspective, um, water plants, um, gas facilities as well, not all necessarily related to the roads project. So I'm going to uh, take a little bit of time, uh, go through the planning to come up with the, uh, up with the capital plan that uh, we are going to present and talk about the values that we see uh, in, the, in an approach like this. So I said a little bit of the focus will be on, uh, on the roads projects. And uh, you know the slide that is before you really is to demonstrate the integration of the type of work that we do. So the roads, utilities, infrastructure, and there's some interesting facts on here, I think. Uh, you know, the roads, if we look at the uh, total amount of roads uh, that we are talking about, um, and generally speaking, I, I will round a lot of the numbers off as I go through, uh, through the presentation. So about 850 kilometers, a replacement value of over $800 million. Storm drainage, um, about 400 kilometers, a uh, value of uh, 260 million. Uh, water um, infrastructure, a uh, total of uh, 586 kilometers, a replacement value of uh, just under 700 million, and the same with sanitary, um, just under 700 million, and um, about 500 kilometers in length of sanitary uh, mains. And this is the main infrastructure. This isn't getting into a lot of the laterals and whatnot. In addition to this, we have the electric infrastructure, the gas, the sidewalks, the bridges, the traffic signals, the street lights, and we add all this up, and again, in very round figures, you're talking about replacement value of over $3 billion. So, you know, the value of this infrastructure that we're looking at uh, is extensive. And the capital budgets that I'm going to be presenting tonight, the combination of the three is about, I think, $350 million over the next four years. So again, you know, a fairly significant dollar value that we're looking at here. So if I start to get into a little bit of how we do the planning, how we come up with the projects, the first, uh, first slide here uh, looks at infrastructure funding. And the funding isn't just all looking at dollars, but it's looking at how, um, you know, we're, we're looking at um, basically paying for some of the projects and how um, we now and going into the future look at uh, the amount of money that we currently have and bridge the gap between what we are spending and what we should be spending um, from our asset management plans. And one of the things that I would say to council, if you look at the size of the gap today compared to what it was 15 years ago, there is still a gap there, but it is shrinking. Uh, we are moving in the right direction. One of the key ways we pay for this, obviously, is from the 1% capital tax uh, levy that the city adopted back after amalgamation, and they still continue with it. Um, I think it was great foresight at that point in time, and I think it's something that council needs to uh, continue along with. From the water and sewer perspective, um, the next major area of capital uh, infrastructure spending, 
over half, or I should say approximately half of the revenue that we take in from water and sewer rights. So half the revenue goes towards uh, infrastructure funding, towards capital funding. Uh, development uh, charges, impost fees, that is utilized for um, new growth. So when we talk about the sewage plant that Gerard mentioned, about 50% of that $80 million will be covered off by infos fee, impost fees. So uh, new housing, uh, new industry, whatnot. Um, other things that we look at is our asset management plans, making sure that we're spending the dollars where we need to be spending them, condition assessments, um, replacing only what needs to be because um, you know the, the value of the money is extremely important and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And in research and innovation. And one of the last slides I have from uh, on the Utilities uh, Kingston presentation talks about that, but you know, not only how can we get the maximum life out of our infrastructure, but new ways of going about replacing or rehabilitation, rehabilitating them, and some of the trenchless uh, uh, technologies that we are using on the, uh, the water and wastewater side is a good example. And on the, um, on the uh, road side, uh, some of the uh, different materials for pavement, uh, pavement preservation uh, technologies, asphalt uh, specifications as well. Again, it's, it's ever-changing, and I think sometimes people look at uh, the type of infrastructure that I'm talking about and compare it to, you know, the IT world and say, you know, it's, it's the same, things don't change. That's not true. It is changing very quickly and we are on top of this. So what is multi-year infrastructure planning? And I think a couple of ne next couple of slides are extremely important and they really set the, set the tone for the rest of the evening uh, when I get into more of the specifics. So project uh, selection based on information from long-term plans. Gerard mentioned we have 15-year capital plans. We've had 10-year capital plans for some time now, but we do have 15-year. And these are not just 15-year plans that looks out 15 years from now and say, yeah, we think we're going to need to spend $10 million on our water and sewer assets. These actually are project-based. So a lot of work have gone into these plans. And not just looking at the work that needs to be done, but also the financing, the rates, and whatnot that will support them. Master plans, uh, we have done an incredible amount of work the last number of years developing master plans on the utility side, water, wastewater, the transportation master plan that is going to be presented uh, to council, I believe in uh, March this year, that will really pave the way for your road network for many, many years to come. And we'll address at that time uh, some of the big issues, um, such as the third crossing and the Wellington Street that uh, council will then be able to consider when it goes in their strategic planning session. Asset management plans I mentioned, uh, you know, doing condition analysis, looking at the assets that we have, really looking at what needs to be replaced and what doesn't need to be replaced. And what we find is just because something is older doesn't necessarily need, mean that it needs to be replaced. There's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of science that goes into this now. Land development uh, projects, this is something that is, I would say, a bit different. Um, this go around, the presentation of the four-year plan, it has always been considered, but there are some very key projects that we're going to be tackling over the next four years that are very much driven by development issues. And that has, uh, has been taken uh, into, a pack, uh, into um, account and is impacting our plans. The, uh, the last point, and I just actually added this today, specific timely issues. And there are things that come up from time to time that also will drive the projects. And if I go back seven, eight years ago, the first long-term plan, the main issue driving it at that point was sewer separation. The municipality and utilities Kingston was under a lot of pressure from the Ministry of Environment because of bypasses and whatnot. And the focus at that point in time was sewer separation, CSO tanks. We've done a lot of good work, and as a result of that, we've been able to move on and not look at other issues. From the selection methodology, again, the condition assessment, also looking at risk analysis. You know, if you have a failure um, on the utility side, how many customers are going to be impacted uh, comes, in, uh, comes into play as well. And again, infrastructure to support uh, development as we go forward. Some of the benefits of the multi-year plan. Efficiencies from a number of different perspectives in that the work that the guys do in collecting data so to support the projects uh, in contract procurement. The fact that we can go out to the contracting community and we're actually doing that um, two or three weeks after uh, the budget is approved. Talk to them about the uh, projects that are approved over the next four years and they can plan uh, you know, their workforce to be able to bid on projects, uh, getting projects out early in the year so we get the best prices from the contracting community. Um, the ability to advance and secure permits. There are a lot of permits that we need from uh, Ministry of Environment um, and uh, other authorities to do some of the work, have this planned out in advance so that they're not holding up uh, the actual construction project. And the next one, 
again, another extremely important point, and this is an area that we've been quite successful with in past long-term plans, and that is having the projects not just you know, present them to council and approve, but actually do the engineering work, the design work, so that they're sitting on the shelf, and they're what we call shovel ready. And shovel ready, if, the, if um, either the upper levels of governments announces grant programs so that we can apply for them and get them in and completed within the time frame that, uh, uh, that the governments may uh, come out with. And back when we had the stimulus funding, uh, back a number of years ago, we were very successful with a number of uh, strategic water uh, projects that we had that were due to be done over a couple of years that we were able to bring forward and get, uh, I think it was 60% funding. I think it was like $30 million that we got to advance these projects and, and do them. Uh, so another key area. Um, coordination between uh, project stakeholders. Uh, I have a list of some of these later on. And then, you know, being able to go out and tell the public um, what the projects are, and particularly, um, you know, homeowners, business owners, tell them if there is going to be a disruption. So with the next Princess Street project, although it may not, it's not going to be for another year, we can start working with the BIA now so that they're prepared. And the other aspect of it is, you know, residents we find sometimes who are looking to have um, a street repaired. If the answer is it's not going to happen in the next four years, even knowing that sometimes uh, suffices. Um, so it's just being able to communicate what we are doing not just for a year, but for, you know, two, three, four years uh, is, is a very positive part of this plan. If we look back a little bit at the achievements that we've had as a result of uh, multi-year planning uh, for the last term of council from 2011 to 2014, I've just, I've got some numbers, and again, these are estimates. And they are a combination of the City Engineering Group and Utilities Kingston. So the number of projects is over 100. Kilometers of bike lanes, and this is, this is, uh, important, the bike lanes, the sidewalks, because often we're thinking of just the road surface. It's not the case. We're also looking at active transportation. So um, 30 kilometers of bike lanes, 9 kilometers of new sidewalks, 32 kilometers of rebuilt sidewalks, close to 160 kilometers of uh, roads that were re rebuilt, and 18 kilometers of storm sewers. And in the some of the, um, the joint projects, uh, like the Princess Street one, there is also sidewalks, um, uh, bike lanes and whatnot that don't necessarily get included in the, um, the statistics we have here that are separating that out. Um, looking at the uh, utility side, um, water main, again, it's either new, rebuilt, or, re or rehabilitated. 50 kilometers, sewer main, 25, gas, 12. Facilities that we have upgraded, 11. That could be from a gas regulator station to a, uh, a water treatment plant, like the, um, uh, the West Water Treatment Plant that is currently under construction uh, to, really, uh, to upgrade the capacity there. And the total investment is over $300 million uh, over the uh, past four years. One of the other key uh, points that I wanted to touch on is the program flexibility, because um, uh, doing the multi-year plan, some of the, uh, the negative comments that we'll get is, well, if we approve a three-year or four-year plan, then it's set in stone, and if council's priorities change, you know, we're stuck with this. That's not the case. I think we showed that extremely well with the um, Williamsville, Williamsville revitalization over the last couple of years. That became a priority of council. It was not in our four-year plan. It wasn't even in this four-year plan that we're, we're presenting now. As staff, we realized that was a priority. We worked very quickly uh, to get the engineering work done and to substitute it for other projects, and we were, were able to substitute it so it did not impact the budget. We did not come back to council looking for additional money, but uh, would put that in um, as it was a council priority, and uh, I think the results of that have been extremely good. The other one was the John Counter Boulevard project, phase one and two. This was a bit different in that when we came to council four years ago, we had not included it in and I can't quite recall if it was at budget time, I think it may have been um, um, during the strategic planning session of council, that it was indicated that, uh, actually it was during the strategic planning session, that uh, this was a priority of council. They wanted us to start moving on that. Now this was different, there was a budget, this was a big dollar uh, project, there was additional budget that was allocated for that, but as a result of that, we added it to the list and um, it, the project has been completed uh, over, the, uh, over the course of the last project. And, we have similar results that we actually could go back to the three years before that, to the first multi-term uh, plan. The next couple of slides, I'm not going to go in detail. They are shown um, uh, later in the presentation, but it just looks at the, uh, the level of spending 
on the uh, city engineering side for the next four years um, in different areas. The total of that uh, is about $140 million. And then also um, on the utility side, and the total of that is $215 million. Again, these, I'll talk about these in detail later, but just to give you an idea of the magnitude, the dollar magnitude of the projects that we are talking about in the next four years. So continue on talking about the plan. Um, you know, some of the drivers um, on the transportation side is, again, I talked active transportation. It's not just roadways. Uh, looking at sidewalks, uh, improvements to existing sidewalks, uh, dealing with trip hazards, uh, looking at where sidewalks are required, uh, new linkages between residents, uh, commercial areas, parks, schools, um, cycling lanes. Uh, I think we're quite proud of the work that we have done in regards to cycling lanes. I think if we went back a number of years ago, uh, there was a lot of criticism that we received, not really focusing on, uh, on this type of transportation. Um, I think we've got a great um, east-west network, uh, some north-south as well, and we continue to fill in the gaps or fill in the blanks in that area uh, in uh, special projects for this. And also, you know, when we're looking at the major road projects, making sure that they're, uh, that they're included in. And um, John Connor Boulevard, the part that we've done to this point, I think an excellent example and uh, the revitalization that we did or the repaving of Taylor Kidd Boulevard uh, out to the west, uh, including sidewalks there, um, other uh, good examples. And this is another area talking about the master plans that we are looking on a uh, cycling and pedestrian master plan in 2016. Traffic. Um, you know, it's not just uh, doing the asset management plan, where do we need to replace the roads in conjunction with the infrastructure, but looking how we can improve traffic flow, uh, traffic calming uh, issues, improvements to intersection, rebuilding intersections, installing lights at some new in intersections, uh, also looking at um, pedestrian crosses, crossings, all this taking into account as we uh, come up with the, uh, the projects in the, uh, the long-term plan. And the other issue is the transportation master plan. And again, I'm gonna talk about that a little more in my second presentation uh, when we're looking specifically at public works programs and uh, new roadways. So that was some of the aspects that's taken into account from the more the roads to sidewalk, uh, cycling lane side. Looking at the utilities, and I've got actually three slides that almost duplicate themselves. So if, if I uh, talk wastewater, uh, we look at the facilities, uh, or we have uh, detailed asset management plans for the water plants, the sewage plants, pumping stations. Um, we get operator input from the people running the plants. Uh, we have very formalized condition assessments. So the sewage treatment plant that we're upgrading, it is not just for capacity. The capacity is driving the timelines, but there are a lot of just, you know, nuts, bolts, pipe, pumps, uh, electrical equipment that also needed to be upgraded that's taken into, into account. And the other one on the wastewater side and the water side is the regulatory impacts and the compliance requirements. And this was actually an example that I was going to use when I talked uh, um, on the first side when I said like other timely issues um, and I used the uh, combined sewer overflows. Probably the better example for that was Walkerton. And I think everybody knows what I talk about when I, when I mention Walkerton, but the disaster that happened um, in that community as a result of uh, um, um, issues that happened on their drinking water side. So when Walkerton happened, really that whole industry came to a standstill. There were a lot of new rules, a lot of new regulations that we had to adapt and put into our plan. Hopefully nothing like that ever happens again, but those are the types of things that we need to be aware of. From the linear side, again, looking at the age, the material type, the break history, we do a lot of inspection on the wastewater side, actually putting TV cameras down the pipes, getting an idea of the condition, and then the combined sewage overflow tanks I mentioned. Um, on the water side, a lot of the same. The different one here is fire flow requirements that is also taken into effect. So making sure that there's enough water flow and pressure at the hydrants to fight, uh, fight the fires as required. And on the gas side, um, the one different thing here is uh, very much looking at the material type and the leak history. So we have water main leaks that we deal with, um, you know, they're a priority, but not to, this, uh, not to the extent that a gas uh, leak would be. So taking that into effect on the gas side. Um, the next thing that we do when we put the, or as we're putting the plan together, we do a lot of consultation with a lot of different players. And some of the key ones are noted here. So CFB Kingston, Queen's University, um, Kingston General Hospital, the work that we're doing right now on George Street 
George King Oak Hill, a very key project, particularly in regards to the combined sewage system. It has been for a number of years. We have worked very closely with both Queen's University and Kingston General Hospital to stage this in. There was the work they were doing on the cancer clinic. There has been other some building work that they've been doing. We didn't want to bump up against that. Then there was some research work that we actually moved it out for another year. So there's a lot of stuff like this that we take into account before we uh, either bring projects to council or actually go ahead with the construction of them. Um, the other uh, interesting one here is um, CAT, uh, the Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation, things like bike lanes, uh, sidewalks and whatnot. And then other utility providers to make sure that they coordinate their work with us as best that we can get them to do. Following approval of the plan, which we, uh, we hope to have this week, then there will be communications as to the work that we were going to be doing. As I said earlier, this is, a, uh, I, I think, a great plus for this plan. We talk to the public. We will work with our uh, the city's strategic communication group to um, find the best ways of getting the information out to the public, the stakeholders, and then the construction industry. And I talked about that again before. I view the construction industry as key players in this. Um, they're obviously bidding on this. I mean, this is a line of work for them, but it's important that they are aware of the work that we have coming up so that they have the uh, appropriate staffing. Because the last thing you want to do is have an aggressive capital works program and then ha not have competition in the construction industry to bid on that and get the best prices. So they said that was a, I was going to say brief, I guess brief's not the correct word. Um, and maybe a bit of a, uh, yeah, I'm already past my timeline, I know. Uh, uh, in-depth look at how we go about the planning. Um, uh, I apologize for it being a bit lengthy, but I probably have to apologize several times tonight before I'm done. But I, I think it's important that council realizes the, the, the thinking, the planning, the research, and really the science that goes into this. This is not just driving down the street and say, let's do this street, let's do this plant. There's a lot that goes into it, and I think it's important that, uh, that people realize that. So I'm going to move now into the part that... Um, um, you probably thought I was going to do when I came up and talk about the utilities Kingston's budgets. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to, um, I, I've got a, a, a number of staff here tonight who were involved in this. And um, I'm just going to ask that uh, they stand up for a wave because I, I realize with a new council, you don't uh, know a lot of the staff. So um, I have Randy Murphy and Jim Miller uh, sitting at the front. Um, and um, I have uh, Alan Lucas in the back, uh, Chris Fippen, Kevin McCauley, Sherry Gibson, um, Nicole Truscott, Lindsay Benjamin, um, Brad Joyce, and Karen Santucci. And I'm sorry, sure if I said Kevin McCauley or not. Um, I don't. I think I've got everyone. Um, so these are the UK staff. I, I didn't go through the roles, but everyone that was here. Uh, Everyone is here was very um, um, heavily involved in this and put a lot of work into it. And because it is a four-year plan, and as I, I mentioned the dollar, it's, uh, it, it takes a fair amount of effort to get it here. So I'll start with the, uh, the corporate structure. You saw this at the, um, at the shareholders meeting. The part that we're here tonight to talk about is the municipally owned assets. So the gas, the water, the sewer that are shown in the middle of the slide, and also the appliance rental business. Uh, the electric, um, it, it, it has a different uh, avenue for uh, budget and, uh, and rate approval as the fiber does. Some of the principles, again, that was noted at the last meeting, and just a couple of these I want to touch on. Um, best return to the municipality. So on uh, some of these businesses we're talking about, the gas and the appliance rental, there is a return back to the municipality as a result of that. I haven't actually talked about that tonight, but uh, on the gas, you'll see it in, the, um, in your handouts. I think it's a $2 million a year. And on the appliance rental, it's about a million dollars a year. Um, the lowest possible rates to the customers. There are rate increases that we are going to talk about before the uh, before the end of the end of the presentation. But uh, it is an area that we have focused on to try and maintain them um, at at a fair level. And the one comment that I will make that as we go out after this four-year plan, and and actually even halfway through. The rate increases for the water and the wastewater, although they have been significant over the last while, we have the rate base now to the point that it can actually um, uh, maintain the level of capital investment that we need in, uh, in these utilities on a go-forward basis with rate increases basically at the rate of inflation or a half a percent or so uh, above that. 
and that's with all expenses in. And that's something that we've worked extremely hard at and we're very proud of what we've achieved. Um, maximize coordination for uh, development and infrastructure renewal. I talked a bit about that and uh, I think that's evident. Uh, Rate-based full cost accounting, uh, I, I just mentioned that. Um, you know, everything related to the cost of these utilities is borne by the, uh, by the rate base. They are all as a result of, of user rates. So your water rates pay for everything that takes place in the water utility. There's no cross subsidization and there is no uh, subsidization from the tax base. So um, again, what we're looking at here tonight, uh, the wastewater, the water, the natural gas uh, distribution business, the appliance business, they are owned by the city of Kingston. They are managed by Utilities Kingston. You, City Council, and this is City Council, not the shareholder, as we talked at the last meeting, um, have, the, have the authority to approve the budgets and the rates for these businesses, and the process is obviously in parallel with the municipal budgets. So what we are presenting here this evening for capital uh, is, or what we're looking for, is approval of four years worth of capital expenditure for the wastewater, water, natural glass, and appliance rental business and one year of operating for those same. The rates that will be presented, uh, we are looking for approval for four years for the water and wastewater, so 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And the reason that we're looking for the four years approval of the rates is we have a four-year capital plan. As I mentioned, 50% of the revenue that we take in from these businesses go to capital. So if we don't have the revenue source to uh, support that, it, uh, it makes it difficult uh, to, uh, to do the uh, work that's approved. So that's why we bring them at the same time. For gas, we are looking for an in increase on our portion of the gas rates. Our portion of the gas, uh, every dollar you pay for gas from Utilities Kingston is about 20 cents, stays with us. The rest is passed through that uh, we use to either get the gas here or to purchase it. Um, and it's the first rate increase that we've looked for on our portion since 2010. Only looking for a one year, uh, we try to stay very competitive with union, and that's the reason we're only looking for a one year increase. Same way, the appliance rental business, a very competitive business, we compete uh, with others, and we set our rates for that uh, to be competitive, to, competitive, but to achieve the maximum return that we can. And the miscellaneous rates, these are for, uh, for charges that shouldn't be borne just by the rate payer, and what we do is try to uh, match our cost on these. Also from the water and wastewater rates, uh, we are implementing the results of our cost allocation study that was presented to EITP a week ago. And in, in short, um, we did a fair amount of uh, research over the last four years. We have found that our residential rates are very high in the province, our industrial and commercial are very low. And when we, uh, and we had a consultant work with, on, work with us on it, um, the, the, the cost to actually treat and deliver the water to the residents, um, the residents are paying more than their fair share of the industrial commercial or not. We're trying to narrow the gap and we're phasing it in over 10 years um, and the reason for over 10 years so there's not rate shock to industrial commercial customers and it doesn't threaten their business. So at the end of the day, it will reduce the impact on residential rates and you can see that uh, uh, in the uh, rate increases that we're talking about this year. Uh, funding, um, I, I touched on this early, but I just wanted to go back and note it because it is important. The rates, the water rates, the sewer rates, pay for uh, the operation of the system and the capital improvements to the existing equipment. Impost is, a, is like a development charge. It's paid uh, for uh, new homes, new businesses, and it pays for the uh, part of the infrastructure that is related to growth. So there's a difference between them. Good example is the, uh, is the treatment plants and it usually comes out to about 50-50. 50% to repair the nuts and the bolts, the pumps and whatnot, and 50% to increase the capacity for growth for the next 10 to 20 years. So I've got, uh, I've got some charts with uh, some numbers in here and I will come back to these at the end before we uh, start about the, uh, talking about the approval process. So this looks at our uh, operating budget uh, increases and um, if we total them, it was, um, in, again, in round figures. Last year was about 30 million. This year is about 32 million. And um, in the 32 million, the, um, I would say 
the general um, items are increased about two, two and a half percent. We have some master plans that we do not capitalize at uh, UK that I, I will mention um, that, that make up a fair amount of the, um, uh, the additional two million. And then there are um, some building expenses that also add to that, uh, some of it uh, taxes back to the municipality that we did not have before, and some work on some conservation programs that I'm going to get into in a bit of detail. On the capital side, as I said earlier, uh, for the four years for the, uh, for the four utilities, and, and most of these is the, uh, the water waste and wastewater utility, uh, a total of 215 million. For the water, about 45 million. Wastewater, 150. The big driver again on the wastewater is the sewage treatment plant. And gas, about 17 million. The rate increases that we are looking for approval for, for um, and these are revenue increases, I should say. These are not rate increases. I'll talk about rate increases uh, in a minute. Uh, for the water, 4.7% uh, for 15, and then 3% for the other three years. Wastewater, 5%, and then down to 3.5, and gas, 3.5. And, and I said that is the first increase that we've had or we've looked for on our part of the gas bill since 2010. And I realize the wastewater increases are higher, but if I go back to the slide before, if I look at the capital expenditures that we're looking at over the next four years on the wastewater, it is significant. The uh, residential bill impact, and um, what we have done is if, if you look at... Um, uh, one of our customers in the central part of the city, they get water, wastewater, and gas from us. The impact for a month would be from, would be roughly $3.50 a month. Um, so uh, under a dollar on the water, um, a little over a dollar on the wastewater, and uh, a little over a dollar on the gas. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the impact on a monthly basis. And then if you look at it on a yearly basis, and we, we present it on a yearly basis as well, to compare, um, I mean, taxes are usually looked at on a yearly basis, it's about a $40 a year increase uh, from, uh, from these utilities. If I talk for a minute about uh, the cost allocation study that we did, uh, what we have looked at here um, is the, for the water and wastewater, the rate increases, the impact on a monthly bill for 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And you can see for each year, it's about $2 a month. And it's about 2.6%, well, I'll say 2.5% if you average it out. If we did not do the cost allocation study that we're talking about, so which is uh, softening the impact of rate increases on residential, but increasing it on the, uh, on the uh, commercial industrial, these, the impact would be about double. So that gives you an idea of, of what uh, of, of the impact that has. So I, I'm going to come back to those slides, but I, I just what I like to do is put out front uh, the dollar value and the impact that this is going to have. So as I go through some of the projects and whatnot, council is aware of, of what the cost is going to be. So um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the um, operating some of the operating programs and some of the uh, capital specific ones. So just a few things so uh, council is aware of what we're dealing with on the wastewater side. You know, a fair amount of equipment um, and a very extensive uh, network of pipes. And I'm, I'm not going to read through that. Um, same thing on the water side, uh, three treatment plants, booster station, the, the facilities can be towers, and 586 kilometers of water main. Now just, uh, and it's roughly the same, the water main length as, the, as on the wastewater. And this is just the mains. This is not the laterals or the services. And just to put this in perspective, Last couple of years, I have done a fair amount of work at an office in Toronto that's located at 400 in Steeles. For me to drive from my office to there and back, it is 540 kilometers. So if you laid this pipe out in a straight line, that's basically how far it would get you. I just think that puts it a little bit better in perspective. Not that we want to run water or sewer pipe to Toronto. That's not where I'm going. Um, on the natural gas, gas side, we have one gate station where we, uh, where we uh, take uh, gas from the um, Trans-Canada system and about 250 uh, kilometers of distribution pipe. The value, I talked on this before, um, around 700 million for the wastewater and the water and about 100 million for the gas. So 
some of the things that we are going to focus on for this year, and I realize that I've spent a fair amount of time sort of talking about the systems and whatnot, and now I'm really getting into um, some of the programs, but m my thought was it's probably as important that council realizes how we come up with the programs as what the programs actually are. So on the operating side, we are looking at water and wastewater master plans. We've had master plans. We are looking at um, basically updating them uh, in the next year, and it will provide us a blueprint for the next five years um, for major infrastructure improvements. It was these plans that helped us in determining, uh, you know, the capacity of the water treatment plant that we are currently building and the sewer treatment plant that is in the plans. Uh, I've got uh, two or three slides that look at our conservation programs, and I put these in here because one of the key um, our, um, one of the key concerns that the past council had on the work that we do at Utilities Kingston was focused on conservation. And I think that we've been extremely successful um, on the electric side, which we're not talking about tonight, and also on the water side and some of the programs that we've had. And we've actually been recognized across the province as a leader in some of these. And I, again, I'm not going to go into the detail of these. You can see them on the screen, but some of the things I want to mention. We do have programs um, for um, industrial commercial customers. This was asked at EITP. If you know we're increasing the rates, are there things that we can help them? Yes, there are. We have staff that will go out, they'll do walkthroughs, they'll make suggestions as to how they can conserve. And there are also programs that we have that will help them assist them financially. And if they're interested, the best thing is for them to call us. Steve Sutil, who was at the, um, um, at the uh, shareholders meeting, would be happy to go out and help them out. And one of the things that we're very proud that we have done is kind of offered these in conjunction with the um, provincially mandated electric plans. Also on the conversation side is uh, water loss leakage. Um, like any other community, we have a lot of leaks and we will continue to focus on that. On the wastewater side, we also have some programs and a lot of these were developed as a result of some of the flooding problems we had a few years ago called our preventive plumbing program. Um, we will offer things such as backwater valves, uh, financial assistance towards that, um, some pump programs, um, um, you know, helping people with their weeping towels and whatnot, just connecting them from the, uh, from the system. Again, I'm not going to go into details. I think it's, it's important council realizes uh, these exist. And if you're interested or you have constituents that are interested, just have them call us. And again, uh, we have a lot of services that we offer free of charge. Uh, don't, they don't have to worry if they call in, there's gonna be a charge for somebody to talk to them or come out to them. Um, and again, we're, uh, we're very proud with the success that we have had in these. And as I said, the second bullet point says, you know, since 2012, uh, we've, um, we've contributed over 375,000 in assistance to homeowners. And on the, on the um, plumbing side, where this helps is we can do a whole bunch of work to separate sewers and whatnot, but if, your neighbor is putting their sump pump into their laundry tub that goes into your sanitary sewer or combined sewer, it's gonna end up flooding you out. So, and, you know, it's not just us doing our work on our side of the system, we've gotta to get to the homeowners as well to make this successful. Um, I think I've touched on most of these here. I just, I will skip through them, but I, I just wanted to give council an idea of the type of programs we have. One of the things in, in, was identified in the uh, handout, uh, an allied item, line item, for the uh, 2015 and going forward, it's also starting to add, add natural gas conservation programs um, um, to the uh, conservation um, items that we have for our customers. So some of the capital programs that we're looking at. And um, I've got three slides that just looks quickly, at, again, at the success of um, the last four years. So on the wastewater, we had 82 million approved and we spent um, or committed 78% of that for 64 million. On the water, 141 and 124 has been spent or committed. And on the natural gas, we had um, 9.4 million and all that was spent or committed. So, the, it, so doing that for two reasons to show that when we get these uh, budgets approved, we do the vast majority of the projects. Some of them come in under budget, which is good. The odd one gets canceled. As an example is one that gets canceled and it shows up in this year's capital budget is the uh, water tower on uh, Tower Street. We were planning a refurbishment of that, but because of the work with Williamsville that we hadn't planned on doing in the area and the disruption of it and the water tower, the feeling was we just couldn't do the two projects at the same time. 
So that project didn't happen. That money stays in the uh, Water Capital Reserve Fund. It, it just it never got drawn out, and it will be there for future projects. So projects that we're looking at in the next four years. And I'm just going to touch on some key ones, and, and I'm getting very close to the end of the presentation here. On the wastewater, the biggest project from um, um, the UK perspective is the Cataraqui Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant. It is an $80 million expenditure. It is located uh, in behind in Vista. It is the sewage treatment plant for the west part of the city. It, it was for the former Kingston Township. Um, two things we're going to do there is a significant expansion to the capacity and a refurbishment of the facility because the facility is in bad shape. It needs a lot of work. This project ties in with the next one, which is the Portsmouth pumping station and forest main construction. It's a pumping station that sits at the, um, basically at the bottom of the hill at Portsmouth, um, kind of in the valley there. It currently pumps um, towards City Hall and towards Ravensfield. And it ends up in Ravensfield, but it pumps from there. An awful long ways to pump when you consider that you've got a sewage treatment plant a few kilometers down the road to the west that we are just rebuilding. So what we're going to do is, is basically turn the flows from that station around, put in forest mains, pump the sewage from there to the, uh, to the upgraded facility. That will allow a very significant amount of capacity on the harbor front trunk system, uh, the pipes across the river, and all the infrastructure in the downtown core that will then allow capacity for infill development. And it's capacity that is needed. And I think these two key uh, projects are very strategic. They were talked about extensively with the, uh, with the last council, and we're looking at starting them in 2016. The Days Road pumping station is also tied in with the Cat Bay plant. Um, it is two things again. It is a refurbishment and a addition to capacity to allow for growth in the West End. Highway uh, 15 trunk sewer twinning, um, again, allow for uh, growth along Highway 15. Uh, Princess Street project, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the Young Street project uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, also on the wastewater side is new pumping stations. and. Again, if for, for those that aren't aware, generally the sewage flows by gravity. It flows downhill, but every now and then it gets to the bottom of the hill and it's got to go up. We have a pumping station through force mains that pumps it up and then it flows downhill again. And that's basically the way it goes to get to uh, the treatment facility. So two new pumping stations in response to development proposals, one on Highway 15 and the second in the Cataraqui North uh, area. And then a lot of sewer main rehabilitation project, and this is just general work that we are doing on an ongoing basis. It's just strictly asset management work. We've listed the streets here, and a lot of these are tied in with the city of Kingston's uh, road rehabilitation projects. On the water side, um, a booster station, James Street booster station um, in Berryfield uh, to allow for growth in the east. And it's tied in with a lot of work that we have done in the east over the last number of years. I mentioned the uh, rehabilitation of the uh, Tower Street uh, elevated tank, Prince Street reconstruction to come to in a minute. Front Road, King Street trunk water main. So when we do the new sewer force main from the um, West plant to, to Portsmouth pumping station, we're also at the same time going to install new water mains in there. And the idea of that is to tie the water plant that we are currently rebuilding in the west to the east plant. So the systems will be completely tied together. We're doing that, and we've also done ties in a number of other areas, uh, one near the uh, Via Station on Princess Street. Um, trunk, uh, Taylor Kid, Trunk Main, and again, just the number, a lot of uh, rehabilitation projects, a lot of them using uh, relining technology. Natural gas. Um, we, uh, we've had an issue with some of our gas meters that um, the regulatory body uh, that deals with them has said that we need to replace them. And this is a significant uh, expense over the next couple of years. And also on the water meter side, there are a number of uh, meters that we are looking at changing over the next uh, two or three years. The, the key issue on the, um, on the gas business is steel main replacement. And uh, if you look back at the level of capital expenditure the last couple of years, it has increased and it is over the next four years. And it's generally to focus on the steel main. Back a number of years ago, we replaced all the cast iron main on the system. Um, and now it's time to do the same with the, uh, the steel main and the streets are listed there. And 
we are doing to do a, a condition assessment on a couple of pieces of equipment. One, the high pressure main that comes in from Glen Burnie uh, to our regulator station um, on Railway Street. And then um, uh, just looking at the condition of that, of that um, regulating station on Railway Street. So a um, couple projects I want to talk about in, in conjunction with, um, with the City of Kingston, going back to kind of where I started with the four-year planning and the integrated planning that we all do together. Uh, one of the key projects that um, we are proposing is the next phase of the Princess Street revitalization. I think people are aware that we have done two phases of that already. Uh, I think uh, projects that have been extremely successful. The uh, main drivers here have been sewer rehabilitation. Combined sewage overflow system, we had a lot of problems with uh, backups and flooding on uh, the lower part of Princess Street, separating the sewers. The sewers that are currently there were put in the 1800s. They are actually made of limestone. They're stone box sewers. We can't get a camera down them. We can't do any type of maintenance work on them. So it's, that has been the driver. But as we do it, we basically go on building face to building face and replace everything. The driver has shifted. That is still important. It's still vitally important. But we are seeing a lot of uh, requests for development activity either along Princess Street or just in the side streets off Princess Street. We do not. We do not have the capacity in the sewer system that really to support any development. And when I say any development, more than a couple of apartments in any, in any building. So if we're going to support infill and uh, the revitalization of Princess Street, this project is extremely important. This project is going to be a bit different, and we are working with the BIA, and I have a meeting scheduled with the BIA next week, uh, Lanny and, and I, uh, to talk about this because We've kind of done a block at a time, and we keep coming back and coming back. What we're asking for is to go from Bagot Street to Barry Street, and basically we will do a year's worth. Um, some of the side streets as well. Um, go in, do the work, and then basically stay away probably for the next term of council. Uh, so you, it, it's going to be a fair amount of pain for a longer period of time, but then uh, a, a longer period of time without any pain. Uh, Young Street, um, and we put this here because, again, a combined uh, project, uh, relatively expensive project, and this, again, is driven um, uh, by development, uh, although all the infrastructure needs to be upgraded. And this will facilitate the development that Queens has proposed in the West Campus. Um, I mentioned uh, new technologies. Um, water main uh, relining is one of them that we use, so as opposed to going in, uh, um, you know, if, if the water main doesn't have to be upsized, uh, not the disruption of digging everything up, but digging the odd pit and actually relining the pipe uh, so that uh, you get the performance out of it that it has uh, when it was installed. And there's a number of different um, trenchless technologies that we are working on. One very successful project was a relining of uh, the sewer main from the top of Berryfield Hill down to uh, Ravensview last year that some of you saw. So just I put these in here just for review and these are the last slides I have, I promise. Um, so again, just a look at our operating expenses increase from, in, again, in round numbers, 30 million to 32. The capital budgets, um, obviously a very uh, big dollar item, 215 million in total. Um, the, the key projects here, um, the sewage treatment plant, $80 million plant. This, this combines the rates part and the impost. Uh, it is funded by both as a number of the other projects are. The rate increases, as we talked before, um, just, just a reminder. And the bill impact, again, for uh, the res and, and this would take place if we get the approvals March the 1st of this year. And uh, in subsequent years, it would be January 1st. Again, to look at, um, uh, because uh, we are looking at four-year increases for the water and wastewater on a typical residential customer, uh, about $2 a month on a bill going forward. And again, that has been reduced by about half as a result of the, uh, the presentation to EITP on the cost allocation that was approved at the last EITP meeting that will be coming to council. Um, at the same meeting that hopefully this budget will be going to for approval so that the two will be in, in order as they need be. A um, couple of other real quick uh, comments. As I said, the appliance rental increases, uh, I, I didn't provide detail on them. They are in your binder. These are market driven. It's a competitive business. We need to stay competitive. So we, we basically try to tag our prices just below that of the competition. 
Oh, oops. And then miscellaneous charges uh, there to um, uh, recoup cost of us uh, doing work um, for a customer that we don't think should be borne by the U8 base. And the one other comment, um, you'll notice at the end of the uh, report that deals with the increase for natural gas rate and then the one for the water and wastewater is a change to uh, the bylaw in regards to uh, the time period that we collect uh, if there are billing errors made. Um, we're not changing what we have done. It's just it wasn't necessarily uh, properly documented. Uh, so it's, it's if there has been a problem, we will go back and collect for two years or we will refund for two years. It has been our practice, but we need to get a bylaw. So that's it. So no award for me. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Neal. Thank you. And I really appreciate um, the EITP report that you brought forward considering water and wastewater and, and trying to get the equity that's been missing in, in, in the billing there. I was um, considering, and this may be a question to the CAO, uh, if council chose uh, to request uh, three options, uh, say a five-year, a seven-year, and a 10-year implementation to look at what the impact of the, those options would be, but we don't intend to change either the operating or the capital figures that are in this budget. Would that be in order to come through council? Uh, or should I, should I do some kind of an amendment to the, to the proposal in front of us? It's more of a procedure question, I guess. CEO Hunt. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, if, if I understand the question, you're, you're wondering that when that report and the endorsement that EITP gave it comes to council, if council at that time decided on a different phase-in period, um, would, would that then impact future rates beyond what Mr. Keach is proposing. And so I could maybe then, having phrased that question, ask Mr. Keach to respond to that. I'm sorry, no, I'm confused. Um, so so if, if we're talking, if we're talking future rates out past the four years we have here, I would say that yes, because one of the comments that we made at EITP is we're only taking it into account for these four years. Then four years from now, somebody from UK would be back talking about what to do for the next four years. And at that point in time, the feeling was, let's, let's accelerate. I would say that, that that would be quite doable. Okay, so if we were indeed to say, please, um, because I, I know you crunched the numbers, you mentioned that you had to look at it in a five year or longer, and what is being proposed is 10 years to reach that equity across classes. Uh, if, if we requested those options and we were to alter that, that would alter the bottom line here for both operating and capital, would it? So we had um, a change like that, and one of the things I tried to do on my slides was was differentiate between revenue and rates. So it would not impact the revenue, so it would not impact the operating or the capital, uh, the revenue, uh, to support that. It would impact the rates uh, and the rate charts and whatnot. Um, so, we, if the, so then if the question is, can we provide um, options as to the impact it would have on the different user rates looking at 10 years, seven years, five years, I, 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 just, I forget the, the timelines you said. We could provide that back. It's relatively, I'm not gonna look at my staff so they don't shoot daggers at me. It's relatively easy to do on the residential side. It is extremely difficult to do on the industrial commercial side because it, it depends on the size of meter, um, the amount used and whatnot. And the reason that we were phasing it in was not to have the rate impact on the industrial and the commercial. And um, one of the comments that we made at EIT is unfortunately, it's not as simple as if we reduce residential by a percent, 
the other goes up by a percent, and I'm, I'm going by memory here because the revenue we derive for residential is about 20 million or maybe 30 million, and no, about 20 million, and from the other, I think, is about 10 because uh, we most of our customers are. are yeah, right I, I appreciate that, but the actual figures, the lines that we're looking at at the budget for both. Uh, operating and uh, for this four-year budget would remain the same, but the allocations and which which groups would be paying to reach those within a five-year plan, say, or phased in over seven years, would be different. So we'd be lowering, uh, getting closer to equity with residential. Is that accurate? Yeah. The okay. Our our, our spending will not change. What will be impact is the actual rates that would be approved that we charge residential customers and the different industrial commercial. Great, thank you. My other question was, I, I appreciate all of the Williamsville streets that were identified that for getting a sewer relining uh, and Mac and Helen and, and college, I believe it was, uh, those, that won't be an actual dig, will it? That that technology is done above ground, so there'd be some disruption, but not a major dig. Is that accurate? I'm going to let. I I think it's I think it's major dig, but I'm going to let Mr. Miller respond. To Thank that. you. Through your worship, um, I think the streets that you're referring to are are identified as part of the rehab or rehabilitation activity, which does not typically involve open trench, uh, but does involve uh, excavation of pits to allow equipment into the pipes to repair, reline, uh, put a liner through, seal, grout, and do what we call in-pipe work. So it's a, it's a little pain, not a big pain. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Councillor Stroud. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Commissioner, Ke Commissioner Keach, I have a question about the uh, infrastructure improvements for, with, with regards to the big dig. And I know that you, you are meeting with the DBIA to discuss uh, in the near future. You mentioned the, that there is no capacity for development in the downtown area right now with the sewers and the infrastructure the way that it is uh, before it's improved. And I know that there has been some work and there's more work planned. Uh, would, <clears throat> and I know there's going to be a discussion on the method of implementation of this, of this big dig if it, it you know, if there's, there's a question of timelines. Uh, my question is twofold. Uh, would the different options as to timelines have any impact on the impending development of the north block section of downtown? And the other question would be, um, uh, I guess, is there, is there any aspect to the, uh, to the uh, infrastructure improvements and the increased capacity uh, outside of that that would be impacted by the timeline? Yeah, the, 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 the quick answer is probably no. Um, we, you know, if, if, um, if North Block were start to develop, we would want to time the projects or time the workflow so that they weren't bumping up against each other. Um, and we've, we, we, we've done that uh, for other projects. And as far as projects outside of there, there's nothing that I'm aware of that it would, uh, that it would impact. But uh, I go back to some of the slides we showed about consultation and whatnot. Um, this this project would probably be the most consulted one that we will do, and and, and that will all be taken into account. And the, the valid point, the, the north block, we have thought about. It's it's a, it's a good point. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, just on the general front, um, you were talking. Uh, Taking in the, um, are we taking in the amount of capital funding necessary to meet future replacements? I think you indicated that there was a gap. And I'm just wondering at this point what the gap is. So Approximately, that, I know it yeah. moves around. 
So um, that was, I think, on my very first slide, or one of the very first slides I, I put up, and it was um, it was talking about the gap, kind of overall, for all the different types of infrastructure. I would say there is um, there's still a significant gap on the roads. Um, I, I think we're spending I think we're spending about 20 million a year. Um, uh, in roads infrastructure, and it probably should be closer to double that. Now, we've got some, um, the, um, oh, the uh, John Connor Boulevard project right now that has some impact on that. So there, there, is, there is a bit of a gap there. Now, again, I'm, as I said at the start, a lot of my numbers are, are, are estimates and fairly general. If I go to the UK side, which I'm, I'm kind of focused on at the moment, um, I think with um, the rate increases that we have proposed today, um, on the water and wastewater, I, I think we're gonna have these businesses to the point where uh, the, the gap is pretty much met, with the exception of um, large treatment facilities. Uh, and, and what I mean by that, if, um, if I look at the, rev the revenues that we will take in is about 30 million a year. Our capital expenditure is in the neighborhood of 10 million a year. And if you go through the numbers I put up, as I think the, the value is about 600 million. Um, you figure the life expectancy is, I don't know, 30, 40 years. You do the math, it's about 12 million a year that we should be reinvesting. Um, and the revenue that we have with the operating expenses, I think for the utilities perspective, is pretty close to, um, to funding where, where the gap uh, on, on those businesses uh, don't exist. So I, I, I'd say we're in pretty good shape there. I think the CAO wants CAO, to do add you want to add something? So if I could, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could just add to that comment. So part of the closure of the gap is the continued recommendation of the 1% increase for capital. Um, the gap is made up of deteriorated assets, which comes from a long history of uh, deficient levels of spending. Uh, but at the same time, the, the investment in roads needs to line up with the capital of, uh, and investment requirements of the utilities, otherwise one gets ahead of the other. And so we believe, and the uh, Treasurer will go through this, that when you look at the way the debt is modeled, you will see that as the 1% continues to grow, it'll close the gap over time on all of our assets, which will take us away from the dependency on debt and more as a pay-as-you-go. I think the other point that is fair to say is that there's only so much capacity in the, in the staff resources to be able to manage infrastructure uh, projects, and you also want to be able to get traffic around the city during the time you're updating the, uh, the, the various roads uh, and planning that work. Thank you. Um, on the John Counter Boulevard development, um, which, do we have studies that show that the, I know we're going to do some part of it or all of it at $12 million a year approximately, according to what the treasurer told me. So my question is, do studies show that it's really needed at this time? And is the bridge really needed at this time? And will it be needed in four or five years? So, so the um, John Connor Boulevard project will be part um, of the uh, municipal capital budget, but I don't mind answering the question now because I sort of pulled them all in. So uh, the John Connor Boulevard project was a very integral part of the transportation master plan, and the transportation master plan basically pulls together a network of roads uh, of which that project uh, is extremely important. Um, I think the the project that we have done to date has alleviated some of the issues with John Connor Boulevard. I think um, the next part is extremely important. I think the timing is important. I think also this council needs to realize that if you approve it Thursday, I guess, um, it will be five years before you're driving a car over top of the bridge. 
Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of things are going to take place and a lot of things are going to change in that time. Same way with the sewage plant. Um, I mean, the, the, really the sewage plant is, is needed like sort of three years out from now, it's going to be critical, but it's going to take three years to go through the process and build. So taking that into account, I'd say, yes, it is essential that it be approved at this point. Okay, I guess what I was asking was whether the bridge could be pushed out further and that we just put the road across without the bridge. So the, um, the way the project is designed, uh, we've done the first two phases, I believe. There are three more. One is the preloading, so basically piling the rock up and let it settle. Then there's the roadway to the bridge and the roadway away from the bridge, um, and then the bridge itself. Um, I guess counts, you know, if you wanted to split them up, you could do the road, a bit of the road work that would go to the bridge. Um, you could possibly like do the preloading um, and then look to um, uh, do the, the bridge part at another date. I think from staff perspective, our feeling is um, they made two very um, good construction projects that when done um, um, assisted in the flow of traffic. And I'm not sure the value of doing sort of the road work now and not doing the bridge. Okay, I think that I was looking for where in the capital budget space could be uh, loosened up for other projects. So you gave me my answer, I think, which is possibly. <laughs> um, my, I have one more question. I didn't see, you concentrated in the CAD Rockway Bay wastewater, which is, you know, I understand the priority. And, um, and the Mount Pleasant, uh, the Point Pleasant, excuse me, going back to my background there, Point Pleasant um, water treatment plant, um, it's it's in around the 80, 85 million as well, is it? Or? So the, um, the Cat Bay is I, around 80. I didn't see Pleasant, it there, that's why. I it was, so the Point Pleasant was actually uh, approved by last council. Um, mm -hmm. It is, uh, it's underway, mm -hmm. I think it was about a $60 million project. Um, I actually had, I actually had a number of pictures of some of the key projects we're working on, but I thought the presentation was maybe a little too long, so I took that out. Um, uh, so it is underway, it was approved, the project is going well, um, and I think it's in line for completion um, the end of 2015 or early 2016. Fair enough, now I understand why I didn't see it. So, um, but we, in the last term, we were always talking about them sort of together. And so my next question is, and this is sort of anticipating the question when people say, what is the city doing to help uh, economic development? Uh, so how much is this, of these projects is for accommodating current need as versus accommodating future growth? In round figures, both of them about half and half. About half and half. Yeah. Okay, so I just think it's a good point to make. <laughs> Should it ever come up? And um, the last question I had had to do with leaks, and we one time a few years ago we were talking about how much money is lost to leaks or what was estimated since... Most of the time we don't know they're there until we come across them again and fix them. And so, do you have an idea what the estimated losses are now from leaks? And um, am, I'm wondering where most of the leaks take place and why. So I, um, I, I don't have from a dollar value. Um, if, if council's interested in that, I can get that, but that's gonna take a little bit of work, but I, I, I don't have a problem doing that and we can just uh, provide that in, in an update or, or whatnot. Um, the the amount of water pump that's lost is 30 to 40 percent. It's still fairly extensive it, and that's despite all the rehabilitation work that we've done, the new water mains that we've put in and, and some leak detection. So one of the things that we are looking at now is doing some um, specific work just trying to find um, the source of some of these leaks. Um, where it takes place um, um, it, the central part, the west part. I, I would say probably more central and west than the east. I think that's, yeah. But it's not, I think there's a perception while it's not only old city, but it's, it's, it's pretty equal between the central and the west, but not, not a lot in the east. Thank you. Councillor George. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Patterson. Um, through you, 
just going back to the uh, the bridge overpass, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Keach, but I thought the previous council approved moving forward with that project and looking at allocating the funding for that as part of being shovel ready, as the term was we used last time around, because we wanted to be in a position that if government grants at the provincial federal level come up uh, at any time in the future, we have to be, as they refer to, shovel ready to put an application in to access, access some of that grant money. And if we're not shovel ready, we don't have that option available to us. So, so we're talking the John Connor Boulevard? John right? Connor okay. Boulevard, okay. sorry. I yeah. want to be sure. <laughs> so yeah, when, uh, when the previous council said build the first two phases, it was, uh, we were also to have this project ready to go. Um, that involved design, um, tender documents, um, property procurement. Right, I was just trying to recall just to make sure that we're not going to back, back pedal on something that we had previously agreed that we were going to get in place so that uh, we can access some higher level money if it's available to help op offset the cost of this. I think that's just, you know, so that everybody has that knowledge. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Okay. Uh, oh, Councillor Holland. Just a quick one, I, I hope. Um, I'm just looking at the natural gas conservation program scheduled for 2015, and there was a slide that mentioned um, there being a single point of contact for conservation programs. Yes. Um, so is this, this 54,000 for the natural gas component tied into an operating budget in another conservation program? So, um, so, so we, one, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is having a single point of contact for all the conservation. And I, I probably should have elaborated on this. That's a good question. So we, we tend to talk about particularly the electric and the water. This is the first time that we sort of um, went into the uh, natural gas conservation program. Steve Sotil, who, uh, who has been heading the others up, will be, uh, be heading up the uh, gas as well. So that, that if, if people have an interest, uh, give Steve a call. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we'll um, move to deliberations and approval of municipal utilities operating and capital budgets. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a minute? Okay, so. First, we have the council approve the 2015 municipal utility operating budgets in the amounts noted below. You see that for wastewater, water, gas, and appliance rental business. The council approve the four year municipal utility capital budgets as follows. You see those four amounts. The council approve funding for the four year municipal utility capital budgets as follows. You see the amounts for the reserve funds. So that's all for number one. So can I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Schell. Okay, we'll call the vote. Please vote. And that carries. So next we'll move to approval of rate changes for 2015 to 2018 for water and wastewater rates. So the council approve, so there's two clauses there, both related to water and wastewater rates. I have a mover, moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Turner. And call the vote. Still waiting for one person? That carries. Next, under C, approval of local distribution rate change for gas. Again, there's two clauses there related to the rate changes. Can I have a mover? Moved by Councillor George. Can I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Stroud. Okay, we'll call the vote. And that 
carries. And then D, approval of rate charges for 2015 for municip miscellaneous charges and the appliance rental business. And again, there are two clauses there. We can have a mover. Moved by Councillor Neal. Seconded by Councillor Candon. And call the vote. And that carries. Okay, moving on to uh, number eight, municipal operating and capital budget overview. And uh, Ms. Kennedy, our treasurer, will present that to us. Thank you, Your Worship. So first of all, um, I'm going to, to try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, but Mr. Keach probably has time to go back to JCB and get your uh, award from last year to hand in. Um, so my job tonight is just to give you a bit of an overview of the, uh, the municipal budget uh, and what you'll be hearing uh, for the remainder of tonight as well as tomorrow night from the departments and the agencies. Um, so I'm going to try to look at it just from a corporate standpoint. Um, I will go through some of it fairly quickly because some of it is in the report, and I'm sure you've read the binders at least twice, if not three or four times from cover to cover, so um, I, won't, uh, I won't dwell on, on a lot of the numbers. Um, but just to, uh, to introduce the budget, first of all, so the budget does incorporate a municipal tax increase of 2.5%. And at a high level, how did we get there? So we've done a little bit of analysis on the numbers, um, and I will be looking a little bit at some of the uh, inflation and some of the economic condition information that we've used in preparing the budget. We used about a 2% uh, factor for inflation, plus the 1% for the capital levy. Uh, so you'll see that within the budget. We have about 0.8% of the total budget which represents increased service demands and enhancements. So, and you'll hear quite a bit about that throughout the, uh, the next couple nights in terms of the things that are within there from the commissioners. Um, so anybody doing the math, we're way above the 2.5%. Uh, we will talk about growth in the budget, and, and one of my slides addresses that, which is about 8%, so that brings us back down a bit. And then finally, probably the one that I think that we as staff are most proud of, I certainly am most proud of, is the 0.5% in net savings and efficiencies. So as the CAO said in, in his opening remarks, um, we don't just kind of take last year and add 2% because that's inflation. There's a lot of work and a lot of diligence that goes into every line item on the budget. Um, and there is a section in your report that gives you a bit of information on, on the budget process and, and how it uh, happens. Um, but we've estimated about 0.5% to get us back to the two and a half in terms of, of savings, efficiencies, uh, doing things differently and a number of items like that and, and you'll hear quite a bit about that through the next couple of nights. The department does, or the budget does maintain frontline service levels um, as well as some council approved initiatives. So you will hear about those. You'll hear about the express transit and some other transit services. Um, there is continued investment in the culture plan from the culture master plan um, and we do have some some monies there we did slow that investment down over the last couple of years and so there is a portion in there um, as well as some other things that uh, that are specific within the budgets that we'll be we'll be talking about so I just want to step back for a moment and talk a little bit about the uh, inflation target that we use so We've done a bit of an analysis here, and this was a little more of a challenge this year for sure than it was last year. Um, if you look at the graph, you can see a year ago, we were down around 1.5% for Ontario CPI, and this is all items in. Uh, it's creeped up, and coming into the end of 14, we're certainly up around the 2.5% mark, and, and that's, while I said we sort of have been using 2%, our reality is 2.5% is uh, right now. Um, we tend to zero in on about 2%. That is the, uh, the Bank of Canada target rate, is to maintain it somewhere around the 2% uh, amount. Um, and in terms of some of the other work that we've done in terms of outlook, certainly the TD economics outlook um, has 2% in terms of uh, for the 2015. 
Um, you will see in terms of how we found some of that 0.5%, certainly where we have discretionary amounts, you'll see that inflation has been absorbed in a number of those accounts uh, throughout the budget in many areas. I did just throw in something too. We, we have certainly a couple of critical accounts that we keep a very close eye on. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about our utility costs and our fuel costs. And so I had just done, um, given, provide a little bit more information in terms of the energy, uh, CPI with respect to the energy, which would include both of those amounts. And you can see even pulling those out, because we do sort of deal with those separately, you know, we're still around the, uh, the two and a half or above mark that we're, that we're dealing with at this point. So as I said, we have a 2.5% a tax rate increase, and you can see here um, our total net budget has gone up just about $203 million. And that's made up of, in terms of how we're funding that, is our tax revenues with a 2.5% increase is $201 million, and we have $1.5 million from assessment growth. So new assessment that has come on the roll for 2015 um, is providing about $1.5 million. And you will hear some of the initiatives that we've done in the past and that we'll be continuing to do with respect to uh, that line and maintaining that assessment growth line. If we didn't have that, obviously we would have a 3.3% tax increase. So it's important that, uh, that we keep an eye on that. Um, and I should just say in terms of the, the tax percentage increase, um, obviously, final bills increases will vary depending on, obviously, property assessment shifts. So as we start to analyze that before we bring the final tax levy to council, um, as well as tax ratios and changes in the education tax. So unfortunately, we do not have the education tax rate at this point. Um, I'm expecting it hopefully by the end of January or very early in February. I think we had it January the 29th last year it came in. We've been very fortunate in terms of the way that the province has been setting that rate, particularly for residential. They've been keeping it fairly flat. Uh, so they've been adjusting for the assessment growth, but there hasn't been an increase. So that certainly helps our taxpayers because if you have a 2.5% on the municipal side um, and you have a 0% on the education, it means on average about a 0.5% difference. So instead of 25 you're looking at about 2% for residential based on the proportion of, of education to, uh, to municipal. Um, so hopefully we will have some good news. We have nothing. The province is not willing to share a whole lot of information up front. I was a little concerned last year. There was some rumors that they were starting to look at the their strategies for the education rates and there should be, could be some changes. We didn't see that last year um, and I haven't heard much more in this, in this past year. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have some good news in that regard in the next couple of weeks. Um, so the um, page nine of the, uh, the council report just gives you a high level in terms of the operating budget revenues and expenditures. And we've broken it down here just in terms of the, uh, the categories. And I'm going to just run through them uh, in terms of some of the differences that we're seeing. And you will hear some of this from me tonight as well as the commissioners uh, in the next couple nights as they go into a little more detail in their areas. Um, you'll hear some repetitiveness in terms of some of the larger items that are within there and, and what's driving some of the numbers. So on the revenue side, I want to talk a little bit about the payments in lieu. Um, and you'll see in that chart that payments in lieu of taxes, which is our taxes that are paid by the federal and provincial governments, um, as well as other government agencies, has gone up about $725,000. Uh, that is mainly due to some new facilities at the local prisons that are coming on board in 2015. So the majority of that relates to growth as well as the, the uh, tax increase that we apply against that. We do have a bit of risk here with respect to assessment changes for the Kingston Penitentiary. Um, last year we did reduce the uh, assessment for a vacancy rebate and, and the feds don't actually take a vacancy rebate but they actually, because they can actually set their assessment, they kind of tell us, well we're dropping it to this because we've done this. Um, and so we have built in a, a uh, 
an allowance for what would roughly have been about 30% of their assessment. And so we now have that built into the budget. Um, there is still certainly a risk there in terms of what might happen with that and where they're going to go in terms of perhaps requesting a, a lower assessment. Uh, so we are working very closely with them and we actually over the last year have built a, uh, a little better relationship and a little better communication process with the feds in terms of as they are um, implementing changes in assessment, they're now notifying us directly as opposed to it going through MPAC. So uh, we'll certainly stay in tune with that. The, the fees and charges, you'll remember you passed the fees and charges bylaw the last meeting in December. And basically per policy for fees and charges, we increase our charges by inflation uh, plus the 1% for capital. Uh, in some cases it went up a little more than that, in some a little less than that, and, and the reasons were laid out in that report. But generally we were looking at around a 3% increase. Uh, the reason that this is only showing about a 1.1% increase is in 2014, we had a one-time large institutional uh, building permit for the, uh, the hospital out on King Street. We knew that was coming. We had a fair idea how much it was going to be and we built it into the budget for 2014. Uh, and it was about a million dollars. So unfortunately, that's not in the 2015 budget, so that's, that's coming off of our net. If you took that amount off, you'd be right around the 3% in terms of uh, increases in fees and charges. Uh, provincial grants, so a couple of things here, has increased about 7.6%. The majority of these monies are in the community services, and Commissioner Hurdle will be providing more information on that tomorrow night. Um, but there's a couple of things happening. First of all, there is the continued upload of uh, the provincial share of Ontario Works. Um, I think that's continuing till 2018 is the, uh, is the year that it's up to 100%. So we're at 91.4. So that has provided us with some room um, and an increase in the grants. And then we've also have some additional funding received for the homelessness and affordable housing programs and Council just passed that report and the recommendations from that report uh, last meeting or two meetings ago. And transfers from reserves of reserve funds. Uh, so this has gone down. So this is money coming back from our reserves and reserve funds back into our operating budget as funding. Uh, and it's reduced by about 1.2%. Again, we have something happening that happened in 2014 um, that previous council had passed. We had, as you remember, a very uh, extraordinary winter last year and some uh, unanticipated winter control challenges with respect to that. Um, and so we actually, council had passed a budget amendment to add about a million and a half dollars towards that winter control and some of the uh, um, the expenditures that were required in that. That came from our working fund reserve, um, which is in accordance with policy as a, a one-time unexpected expenditure. Uh, so in the budget, we did an amendment to bring in that million and a half from the working fund in 14. Haven't done the same thing in 15, and, and Mr. Keach will be talking about the, uh, the winter control and how that's budgeted. Um, but that was certainly a one-time extraordinary amount that we didn't, uh, we have not put back into 2015. There are some other, there's information in your report with respect to some of the other transfers from the reserves and reserve funds. Um, they are in accordance with the reserve fund policy. They're mostly one-time costs. We do have some money that comes in for, um, from development charge contributions that, that for expenditures that are in our operating fund as opposed to our capital fund. And we also have some funding from our uh, building regulatory reserve fund, and you'll hear about that as well uh, tomorrow night from Commissioner Hurdle um, with respect to the building permits and, and some of the funding that comes from there. So on the expenditure side, uh, looking at salaries and wages, so salaries and wages has gone up by about 3% in that category. There's a couple of things that are driving that. First of all, our base salary and benefit rate adjustments. Um, those are all included in accordance with our collective agreements and any of our, our labor contracts. Um, that makes up about 1.9% of that 3% uh, difference. Um, in your report, we've also talked a little bit about some of our challenges with our benefit costs, and, and they are definitely going up by more than inflation. Um, and you will hear about that in the next couple of nights as well as one of our challenges. 
We have included about another uh, 450,000, which represents about 0.4 of that 3% for benefit costs over and above the 2% the of inflation. And uh, we're continuing to work on a number of strategies in terms of trying to control those expenditures and, and uh, working with the insurance companies directly. And then finally, the 0.8% of the three, which is the uh, incremental investment in staffing costs, so that's new staffing costs, and primarily in the transit area for the, uh, the express next phase of the express service, which you'll hear more about from Commissioner Leger. Um, supplies, materials, and others. Now, this is one that has a lot of discretionary amounts in it, and I think is probably one of the categories that you can see very clearly where we have been able to find some savings, um, been able to absorb inflation, and do a number of different things. So you can see that it has gone up 2%, which you would think would just be our 2% inflation. However, included within that uh, 600000 uh, is about $500,000 with respect to the new transit, express transit routes. Um, so that's expanded enhanced service that's in there. Um, and that relates certainly mostly to the fuel and some of the other uh, supplies and material costs for the uh, express transit. Um, utilities, our utility cost is in here. We used an average percentage of about 5% for our uh, utility increases. Um, but within this amount, we also have about $240,000 that includes new facilities. Most of that are the two new uh, UK facilities at JCB. And of course, those, are, those costs are recovered from the utility rates, so they would be an expense there. But it has certainly bumped up. We show it as a cost and then a, a recovery from Utilities Kingston. So we've got about $240,000, um, as well as the 5% of, of uh, that. The other thing that's in there is we do have some savings offsetting that from the streetlights. And Mr. Keach will be talking more about that, um, the streetlight retrofit project. We've been able to recognize some of the uh, utility savings in the 2015 budget. Um, the other thing I just wanted to talk about in this category is the, uh, uh, the fuel costs. So we, this is a number that has moved around, as you can appreciate quite a bit, in the last, uh, the last few weeks. Um, and so we've been very careful in terms of what we've done. We have, we spend about $5 million in fuel um, within the city budget. Um, about $4 million of that is diesel and, and between public works and, and, uh, and transit that use that. So certainly diesel is the one that we keep our eye on the most. We have less than a million dollars of, of gasoline. Um, the diesel hasn't fluctuated quite as much, and we haven't seen quite the variability that we have in the gas, uh, but we certainly have seen that. We went back and looked at what we experienced in 2014. The highest point in 2014 for diesel was probably around $1.43, something like that, at the pumps. Um, I think today, or yesterday I looked at it, it was around a dollar, up to a dollar twenty, I think was the most expensive, I think around a dollar eight, a dollar ten, somewhere in that. There was a bit of a range in the Kingston area. So what we've done, we did actually lower it from our initial projections, um, but we've been very cautious not to lower it too much. And basically the rate that we've got it out is about an average rate um, of the highest from last year to what we basically have today somewhere in between. And the rationale that we've used from that is twofold. One, um, we looking at uh, some of the, the future projections and what might happen. And of course, this is a crystal ball. We're not exactly sure, but, um, but we certainly have in our research found that there is an expectation that it could start to go back up by middle of next year. Um, the jury's still out whether it would go up quickly or whether it would start to gradually go up next year. So we kind of thought, you know, middle of the road, that average is probably safe. The other thing, probably more importantly, that we didn't want to do was create some uh, fluctuations within our operating budget that would be very difficult in terms of trying the impact that would help in future years. Um, and so certainly a compounding effect if we drop it too low now and then we have to bump it back up next year. Um, that can be a challenge as well. So we've kind of gone middle of the road in terms of what we've included for the, uh, for the diesel. Uh, contracted services. So we have a uh, decrease here of 0.7 million, about 3.3%. 3 
Um, again, we spoke about the winter control adjustment of 1.5 million last year that was in the revenue from the working fund. 1.1 of that is in this category, in the expense. So when we did that budget amendment, we bumped up contracted services by 1.1 million in 2014. We've taken that back out for 2015. Um, so if you take that out, our annualized increase for contracted services is actually about $400,000, about 0.4 million. Uh, and there's two or three things that are making that up. Definitely there's been some cost pressures and some new costs, uh, again, particularly with the UK buildings where we're charging the costs into our budget and then uh, recovering them. Um, costs for snow removal, cleaning contracts. Uh, some of our technology maintenance and support has definitely been a challenge for us in terms of some of the costs that we're seeing there. Insurance as well. Insurance represents an increase of 10% uh, over 2014 actuals. We were a little under budget last year, and so that we've actually, we're probably up more closer to 20% over last year's budget, 10% over last year's actual. It's about a $400,000 hit on the insurance. Um, solid waste has helped us out incredibly in terms of some of their contract negotiation for their contracted services. Um, we've seen a savings there of about $250,000, so that's offset some of the other challenges. Just in terms of what's in there, and I know there's been some questions about what's included in contracted services. Um, our insurance obviously is in there. Um, our services that we pay to the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation for all our assessment services, um, we pay about one, one and a half million dollars to MPAC. That would be within contracted services. Um, and then certainly solid waste and our winter control also has some, some contracts there within that. Um, the other thing that's in there is about a million dollars contracted services to Utilities Kingston. So Utilities Kingston does manage our traffic lights uh, and our street lights. Um, and so those costs also show within that category. And then grants and transfers to others um, has increased about four million. This is in line with the provincial side. So again, um, transfers from, for the additional provincial funding that were approved by council towards poverty, homelessness, and, and affordable housing. And then finally, transfers to reserve funds. So you'll see this category has gone up just under two and a half million dollars. Um, the majority of that represents the 1% incremental tax levy for the uh, municipal capital purposes. Um, and, and then the remainder relates to, we did have some reduction in funding strategy. So our funding strategy for the Transit Express service involved collecting monies up front that went towards paying for the capital. Um, and so we were collecting those monies from taxation and from user charges and putting them into the reserves to pay for the, uh, the capital related to the Express service. Um, so now we're starting to, we now have bought most of that capital and so we don't have as much going in there. Um, and the other change that you'll see is the building regulatory transfer. So we did have the million dollars, as I mentioned, of building permit revenue last year from the one institution. Um, and the uh, building, as Commissioner Hurdle will explain tomorrow night, the building process, um, any surpluses from our building department go back into this reserve fund. Um, under legislation, or we pull out if we need to cover costs from the reserve fund. So we certainly had a surplus in 14 because of the million dollars, and so we did put some of that into the transfer. So that was a couple things in 14 that have, uh, have not been included in 2015. So tomorrow night you'll be hearing from all of our uh, boards and agencies <clears throat> the uh, consolidated, they've requested a budget increase of about 2%. Um, there is one variance in there that you'll note in your budget binders that falls under the County of Frontenac, which is the uh, Fairmount home for the agent. I think it's just over $300,000 um, that we don't, we have in 2014 that we didn't require in 2015. And that just related to the auditorium. Um, project that they started a couple of years ago and so we had a couple years where we were uh, funding some of that and that's fallen off the books now so that's helped a little bit in terms of, of bringing that total percentage down 
Um, you'll be hearing from everybody tomorrow night except the County of Frontenac. We have not yet received their budgets. I believe they're just starting in the next couple of weeks into uh, budget deliberations at their County Council. Um, but we have included a 2.5% amount and I have been in contact with the Treasurer at the County to make sure that we're not going to have any big surprises coming up. Um, so what she knows, I know, and so far we're okay with, with the estimates that we've got in there are in line. Um, so hopefully there won't be any surprises. And normally what we'll have to do is, is come back to council with that budget once I receive it, um, and with a strategy as to, as to how that might uh, fit into the budget estimates that have already been passed. So capital, uh, we have about $170 million recommended capital budget. As uh, Mr. Keach said, it includes uh, the four-year budget for public works and the roads-related capital uh, to align with Utilities Kingston. Um, this has been a, a big project for us in terms of updating these plans. As Mr. Keach said, we used to do 10-year plans. We now do 15-year plans, so we, we've gradually been working up to that. This is really the first time that we've done a very comprehensive 15-year plan. Um, and there's been a lot of work. We were directed by council back in 2013 to update these plans and to update them for a number of the studies as, as CAO Hunt had uh, alluded to at the start. There was a number of studies and, and plans that have been updated. They've all been incorporated into these plans. Um, the only thing outstanding now are the uh, strategic planning sessions of, of council coming up. Uh, next month and so we'll be doing another iteration of that after those sessions to make sure that the plans are updated accordingly. Um, they also do reflect the updates for the new development charge and impost fee background study that was done last year. So you do have the 15-year uh, capital plans in your binder as well as all the funding, related funding models. Um, now here's where I'm going to have to come clean. Believe it or not, we made a mistake in the capital budget recommendation. And it was in my area where we made the mistake. I can't even blame one of the other commissioners. So you will see the uh, recommendation that's in the report is a slightly different from the recommendation that I have on the screen here. Um, the difference, it doesn't change the total, but what it does change is the grants and the municipal reserve funds. So there's about $400,000 that we had shown in grants that we should not have had there. It should have been shown up in reserve funds. It relates to uh, a recovery of costs from Utilities Kingston for our financial management system. Um, and we unfortunately put it in twice, and for some reason Mr. Keach did not want to pay me twice for it. That would have been my solution, but um, anyway, so instead we've had to change the numbers. So you will see about a $400,000 shift between the grants line and the municipal reserve line. The totals don't change at all. Um, so key projects, we have touched on this already tonight, but certainly the John Counter Boulevard, we've got $63 million in 2015. As Mr. Keach said, uh, that will actually be spent over the next four or five years. And if you drill down into those detailed models, you will see where we've done that, where we've shown it at 63, and then you'll see where we've actually allocated it out over about four years in terms of our expected uh, cash flow. Um, uh, a few other um, amounts that are in other projects that Mr. Keach will be alluding to in, uh, in the public works budget um, and the solid waste budget. We've got some uh, parks amounts, existing and new parks development, some affordable housing investment, which was something that was approved by the previous council and, and is continuing. Um, some work, some planning and design work for the next phase of the fleet building at 701 Division. The new financial system phase two, you'll remember you approved the purchase of the, uh, the system and the contract um, at the meeting in December. And I said then I'd be back to you with phase two and here I am back with phase two. Um, and then you'll be hearing tomorrow night from the library with respect to some of the uh, central branch renovations that will be ongoing there over the next two or three years. So I wanted to talk to you just quickly about the Standard & Poor's credit rating. Um, so Standard & Poor's comes in and does give us a credit rating, usually in the fall of each year. Um, our credit rating stayed. They affirmed it this past year at a AA rating with a stable outlook. 
um, and, and they give us a report which is available that sort of gives some of the background and, and why the rating is that, uh, that they have affirmed. Um, they do talk about our liquidity and certainly our reserve funds help in that regard. Um, probably more important to me is the comment they made that the city has shown the ability to improve operations by streamlining and reprioritizing resources. So when you hear us talking about, well, it's a $63 million project, but we're going to do it over four years, or we're going to do this one, and then we're going to do that one, um, there is some rationale behind that in terms of the effects that that can have, um, our spending can have on the, uh, the Standard & Poor's credit rating. So I did pop in just a couple of things that, uh, that I know that they look at, and they do provide us with all their numbers and analysis, so we spend quite a bit of time going through those numbers and seeing exactly what they're looking at and how they're, uh, they're evaluating us. Um, and there's two things in particular that I pulled out that they look at. One is our level of spending. Now, they kind of have this convoluted way that they calculate it, and it's kind of based on cash spending, so it's cash in and cash back out. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the, the message to us is that there's up to a certain level of spending. If we start getting a little more aggressive, um, we're going to have some challenges with that. That's not as much an issue in our operating budgets because our operating budgets are fairly standard, but it can be an issue in our capital. If we start spending our capital too quickly, it could create a bit of an issue for us here. Um, the other one that they allude to is our debt levels, obviously. Um, and they look again at our tax supported debt, which in their definition is all of our, our capital debt, um, remain below 120% of our consolidated operating revenues. And again, they have, kind of have their own calculation. But at the end of the day, roughly that means 500,000 or 500 million. I think I got 500,000 there. It should say 500 million. I'd sleep way better if it was only 500,000. So I'll come back to that when we look at the, uh, at the graph, but just to give you an idea where those numbers sometimes come from, this is certainly one of the ones that we keep an eye on, and, and uh, if we start getting higher than that, we are going to have a challenge with our, our credit rating. So I've provided here just a, a bit of a continuity of our debt, and these numbers include the 2015 recommended budget numbers. So you can see we've done this as of starting at December 31st, 2014. We have about $274 million of issued debt that we are paying down at this point in time. We have about another $163 million that's been approved in, in previous budgets by council, but we haven't issued it yet. So we haven't issued it because we haven't spent the money in most cases or uh, we're just waiting until a project is done before we actually do the issue. Um, so in total, if we had issued everything that's approved to date, we would have about $436 million. Um, I've added on to that the debt issuance per the 2015 to 2018 capital budget, which is another $128 million. That includes the Utilities Kingston debt um, in their capital budgets, as well as the amount that's in the municipal capital budgets. And then we've taken off because we're doing a projection to the end of 2018 because we have got the, the four-year um, engineering and utilities budgets. We've taken off the principal repayments for four years, uh, which is about $79 million. And so that brings us down to about $485 million. And we've shown that just by um, tax-supported the utility debt, which includes our impost fund debt, um, and user charges where we do put our development charge debt. So we do borrow on our development charge reserve fund as well. So you can see certainly on utilities is, is uh, that share is up a little higher than the others and certainly that just reflects the, the water and the sewer plant projects that, uh, that are happening. So in terms of cost of debt, um, we just want to take a quick look at, at what interest rates are doing and what we're keeping an eye on. Certainly our current lending rates are at an all-time low and we work, uh, m most of our lending is through Infrastructure Ontario and we have an excellent relationship with them um, and we can what we call permanentize the debt fairly quickly. So even our debt advances while the projects are in process, we can turn into permanent debt and, and lock it in fairly quickly with them. So we keep a very close eye on the rates. Um, infrastructure Ontario rates right now for 25-year debt, just to give you a feel, are in the range of 3 to 3.5%. Three so we're getting some, some pretty good rates from them. Um, looking forward, 
Um, the uh, Scotiabank Global Forecast has projected that the Bank of Canada prime lending rate could start to gradually rise uh, sometime in early 2016. So we're thinking, looking right now at the projections, that we may have another year of, of lower rates. Um, but as I said, we certainly keep an eye on that, and I think that's part of our strategy in terms of when we actually issue the debt. Um, because while we have to balance it with the cash flow and make sure we have the money to repay the debt, uh, the quicker we can get it issued, certainly, and the money spent and the debt issued, uh, we can take advantage of some of these lower rates. So our debt level forecast, and this is uh, in your report, this has been updated for the, the capital plan and the funding models that are being presented tonight and that are recommended. Um, so you can see the, the bars themselves are our projected balance at year end. This is based on our debt issuance timing. So this isn't when you approve it. So you will approve some debt uh, tonight, or hopefully you'll be approving in the recommendations some debt uh, for the public works and the engineering budgets, uh, all in 2015. But we don't show that in 2015. So we do some estimates as to when are those projects going to happen, when are we going to spend the money, and when are we actually going to issue that debt? And that's built in here in terms of a, a cash flow model. Um, so the blue bars are showing in terms of our model what our debt limits are, or our debt values are. You can see, I guess the green line then, um, is what we've been calling the city treasurer recommended. And we started that at about $400 million, and we've got it increasing by 2% inflation. Um, so you'll see the green line going up. And this is where I talked about the 500 from Standard & Poor's. So this is one of the things that, uh, that's reflected within that green line, as well as our ability to repay the debt. And so our reserve funds are what we use to make the debt payments. Um, so again, it's a cash flow in terms of, of our ability to repay. You can see we are slightly going over in 2019 based on the estimates that we've got, um, but we're right back down in 2021. The other thing that's quite exciting to me to be able to see is if you look out to the 15 years, you can start to see it coming down. Um, normally, I'd stand here, I probably wouldn't even point that out because I'd be a little concerned that when you kind of get out in those years, maybe we haven't budgeted quite as much as we should. And there's probably a little bit of that. When you're talking 15 years, it's hard to, to know exactly what we need to be budgeting on the expenditure side. So we may be a little, a little short there. But more importantly, what that reduction in those, those blue bars going out into 2025, 26, 27, 28, is the fact that the 1% capital levy going into our reserve funds allows us to fund more from pay as you go. So we have the cash in the reserve funds um, to be covering off our equipment replacement and renewal and rehabilitation type um, expenditures. So the strategy that we've had for a number of years now and that we continue to have is, is more reliance on the pay-as-you-go, particularly with respect to our, our existing assets, and less reliance on the debt. And you can certainly see that in the graph going out. Um, the, the red line is the upper limit that the province gives us for debt. So you can see it's a little bit ridiculous up there, but that's where it is. And, uh, that's based on our, our budgeted numbers, our revenues and expenses. Um, and so it's up close to a billion dollars. Um, I don't think we'd be around if we had a billion dollars of debt because we'd sure have some problems in terms of being able to repay it. But um, that is a level that, that they set and that we do report to council uh, later in the new year. Um, we will report that in terms of what they've given us and, and where we are against that. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, I wanted to ask this question right away while <clears throat> the slide's still up there. Mm -hmm. uh, the green line has been described to me also as the line above which the city treasurer cannot sleep at night. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if... Uh, if our standard and poor rating might be a, a possibly affected by the, the fact that we're cresting over top of that line in 2019, uh, according to these projections, and what what are the ramifications of that? And also, if uh, <clears throat> if that if if, if that uh, nickname cannot sleep at night is is accurate. Thank you. <laughs> 
It's a good question. Yes, it's very accurate. <laughs> um, so it does affect it for sure. Um, standard and Poor's, I don't think they're going to be too concerned about this because it's out in 2019 and they don't tend to look out quite as far. They look to ensure that we're properly managing this and what our processes are. Um, but they're certainly more interested in, in probably sort of the first three or four years in terms of that. Having said that, they will keep an eye on it for sure. Um, by the time we're getting out to 2019, we are making some assumptions in terms of, of when the monies are going to be spent and when we're actually going to be issuing the debt. Um, and I can tell you, we're, we're pretty, I'm a pretty conservative treasurer, so we're pretty conservative on that. Um, chances are it'll probably shift out a little more than what we've done. The other thing that we do from a conservatism uh, standpoint is the interest rates that we build in. So I said we can probably do three, three and a half right now from Infrastructure Ontario. We build in about five in our planned debt going out, five to five and a half depending on how far out it is. So again, they realize that, they see that some of our assumptions are pretty generous and so they give us credit for that. So it's a good question and, and we do share all this with them and uh, it'll certainly be a discussion that, that we have with them. Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, I, I know we're, thankfully, I think for taxpayers, we're the only level of government that can't carry forward any deficit financing as the other upper tier governments do. Um, I noticed that there's a reference to, uh, in the event that we have, don't realize the growth that we forecast, and I would assume if inflation is slightly higher than we forecast, um, I understand that we would transfer funds out of our working reserve. And I'm just curious whether that, uh, in your estimation, is, is solid enough to uh, face the worst case scenario. So. So the, um, for 2015, so the reason that we did that is we, we struggle in a non-election year, we struggle with what the growth is going to be. Um, normally we're approving budgets in November, doing budgets, so we're, we're basically have binders out sometime in October, um, and we don't even have all the supplementary tax billings done for that year yet. So we struggle on, and MPAC is not great at sort of sharing all the accurate information ahead of time for us on what that growth should be. So we include that as a recommendation um, just to help us in terms of any variances one way or another that there might be. If there's a significant variance, which there was last year, we ended up with quite a bit more growth. And if you'll remember, we came back to council when we did the, the final tax rate and said it was much higher than we thought. There was a bunch of properties that MPAC um, moved quite quickly to get on that we didn't expect would be coming on. And we came back and actually said, we look, looks like we could change and we actually lowered the tax rate. So having said that, we, we potentially could come back. Um, for this year, because we're into January, we pretty much know exactly what the growth is. So I'm not anticipating um, any difference. Um, but sometimes those last minute things, there could be a small amount either way. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, since this is the, in some ways, the general part of the budget, uh, my question is, um, when the last council passed the 2.5% um, parameter, part of that motion was also that frontline services would be maintained. Is that the case in this budget? Yes. It is the case. It is the case? Yes. Okay. So, when I turn the page, uh, the page two here, it indicates that for 2016-17-18, tax increases currently projected at 3.2%, 3.3%, and 2.8%. This is the second paragraph for those that are looking. The, now, we were told that last year and the year before. And the shoe hasn't dropped yet. That is, you haven't come back and said, guess what? This is the year when we nudge over 3% again uh, because of cost pressures or, and we've diminished certain reserve funds and things of that sort to get to that 2.5%. So my question is, it seems to me we need an analysis of where the pressure points are. 
so we can see what the issues might be in the future. I mean, it's clear if you can come into here and you can actually fairly and honestly say, which I, you're that type of person, so I expect that, uh, that we've maintained the frontline services, but there must be pressure points. There must be points where you're having difficulty. And I think it would be good if council knew what those pressure points were. Can you supply that to us? We could. What I, what I would recommend is that I expect you'll hear a lot of that in the commissioner presentations tomorrow night as they get into detail what the pressure points are. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think just is important to say is that, because you're right, and I know you and I have had these conversations about when does the shoe drop, um, but there are a lot of other initiatives underway that are longer term initiatives that, that staff work on in terms of trying to manage the budget. Um, and so they're not necessarily things we would put in today, but you know, in terms of efficiencies, and a good example that I can, we'll be talking about tomorrow night is our new financial management system and some of the efficiencies and the cost savings that we expect to, uh, to see there. So there's a number of items like that that we have in process in terms of being able to address it. But certainly the, the pressure side of it, I've done a couple from the corporate side, but you'll be hearing more from the commissioners. Say, Johan. Excuse me, uh, uh, through your worship, to supplement that. So if Council were to refer at this point in time to exhibit uh, A part four, which is in your report, if you move to exhibit A, the slide that I showed when I was doing the presentation. Let's give you a couple of seconds to turn to that slide. It's the multi-year forecast slide. And you look at the column 2016 forecast, and then you look at the variance column beside that, you can see where the pressure points are based on the forecast. Not that one. So you can see where the pressure points are. If you look in the public works services, there's three departments there. It says that based on our forecast that that would be approximately 4.24% increase next year. If we're trying to stay in the range of 25 to 3%, then anything that's over 25 to 3% is a pressure point. So based on the information that's in the report that you'll hear from Mr. Keach and what you're seeing here, we already know that we have an estimate of an increase of cost of about $250,000 for winter control already forecast in that area based on some of the preliminary work. So that's the way to read that. So that number at the bottom that I talked about of 1.3 million, that really becomes the, the challenge for staff and for council. Because as we talked about at the previous council strategic planning session, when you do set the level, you will also be setting certain expectations with, with respect to services. So example, at the last strategic planning session, you talked about or you had, you had an increase in the investment in transit. So we can then forecast and predict what that cost is. And then if you tell us that in spite of those increases, you also want us to tighten the budget from a tax increase perspective. Then you basically give staff the marching orders to go away and find it. We've been fortunate in the last couple of years to be able to do that from efficiencies and savings and changes to the way we did do things without, without actually impacting frontline services. In fact, we've been enhancing frontline services while we've done that. But there may come a point in time where we would have to have a conversation with council about which, which services you wanted to reduce and or change to the extent even to eliminate. Because as you're trying, as you're alluding to, I think, is that at some point in time, you know, there's only so many dollars that eventually can go around. So it's our view that, you know, we take that very seriously. Uh, I personally take that direction seriously. It is part of the goals that you set for the Chief Administrative Officer. 
And we have a good team that works collectively at finding those solutions, but we will also uh, come back and try to get council to help us with this. And sometimes it's a matter of me putting up my hand and say, you know, we, we are at capacity, folks, and if you want us to do that, you'll have to take some things off our plate. I don't like to do that very often, as you know, but I know that uh, the councils in the past have given, given me the discretion to be able to do that because that becomes a partnership of trust that we need to have in terms of trying to manage the resources of the organization. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison, are you finished? Any um, questions? I think so. Can I just get back to where I was? Sure. Just uh, the, oh, I just had one question about the, what I call, well, the immigration in migration strategy, which was part of our strategic plan last term, but we didn't get it. So I'm just wondering when we're going to get it. Say it one. seems to be very important for social and economic reasons. Thank you. It's for you, Your Worship. I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Hurdle to add to my comments. But yes, it was part of uh, Council strategic planning uh, uh, priority setting session uh, the last time. Um, it's not as straightforward as just doing a strategy to attract people. Uh, part of what we needed to understand was the population, housing, and employment statistics uh, that was worked on in 2013. Uh, and culminated with Council's approval of that, that report in 2014. And what that does is it provides us with an understanding of the job growth, the housing growth, and the population growth over a period, over a long-term period. Uh, what we also know is that in the GTA it is growing uh, extremely fast and that there will be spillover migration. When we say migration, we don't only talk about immigration, we talk about migration within the, within the uh, country. Uh, and as a result of that spillover, we know that some of that will come to Kingston, but we don't really know at this point in time how much. So I just want to leave you with the idea that it's not always about attraction from a strat strategy perspective. It may very well be about um, management and growth in, in the sector. And we have been working very closely with KIPP for a number of years on the newcomer portal and, and being open to Im immigrants and those that want to come to Kingston, a great quality of life, all those sorts of things. So we didn't really want to launch out with that until uh, we understood the landscape, if you will, a little, a little clearer. Um, in addition, we did not ask for budget funds from any previous budget until we kind of understood that, and that's why it's in this budget. And I invite uh, Commissioner Hurdle to add to that. Just to uh, maybe uh, give a little bit more context, what we wanted to do as well was to work with some of the major uh, institution in town and uh, an organization, so the major employers, to get a sense of what they, they feel their needs are going to be uh, going forward in the future. Because I think we need to, we need to look at this strategy in a way where we're going to be able to attract people that are going to have the skills that we're going to require in the workforce to fill those gaps that we know are going to be coming up, uh, specifically in the healthcare and also education sector, which was identified in the uh, population uh, growth uh, study. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we took the proper time to do some of that uh, that work and also have some of those conversations with those organizations before we got really going too far with the strategy. Thank you. I guess the easy way to say is not just attraction but opportunity and accommodation. Okay. okay. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Neal? Yeah, just very quickly. Uh, you partially answered my question, Commissioner Hurdle. I think you're half psychic. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, and, and I really appreciate that there is a budget line now dedicated for this really important uh, uh, process. Uh, we do have, as you mentioned, uh, organizations in town like Keys, uh, like Kingston Immigration Services, that are already doing 
um, some of the work that I'm sure will overlap with, with, with the work of the city. And we have uh, Queens and other, uh, and RMC, St. Lawrence, that have an international student component as well. And those are some of the people I think we want to try to entice to stay in the city after graduation. So, so some of these uh, funds I would hope would be used so that we can work, develop collaborative uh, conferences or workshops or work within uh, the community with some of those key stakeholders. Commissioner Hurl. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that uh, that is the intent. We will most likely also uh, retain um, some support services to help us pull together the strategy because it will be a lot of work. Uh, but the intent is to include those various agencies, organization, because there are really two components. One is the attraction, so to be able to attract people that have the skills that we're going to require to fill the jobs that are going to be vacant. But the second part is then how do we retain? Because sometimes we do attract talent to the city, and what we often see is a few years later, now that they've gained some experience, they move to the GTA area or Ottawa. So how do we make sure that once we have those people here, then we work on retention? So there are a number of agencies, obviously, in the community that are doing a lot of work around you know, quality of life and retention. So we will be working with those. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, I just have a couple of questions. Um, you'd mentioned on the slide about Standard & Poor's of the comment that they pick out is that the city has shown an ability to streamline and define efficiencies. So is it fair to say that, that setting the tax rate in such a way that, that demands those continued search for, for efficiencies is actually something that contributes to a good financial reputation for the city and that that's something that we probably should be mandating every year? Absolutely, I think that's fair. I mean, they do a very, very thorough review of not only the numbers, but our processes and our management and our and our and our models. So yes, I think that's that's very fair. That that would be one element that they would consider. Okay. My second question is um, for those of you that were at the uh, the Queen's School of Business forecast lunch in December, um, they threw out that they expect interest rates to rise this year. So I'm interested to know if you can give us a perspective of just how sensitive our, our estimates are to a change in interest rates this year, keeping in mind that we're also we're borrowing, but we also have funds that we're investing as well. And what would be the net effect if interest rates were to rise more quickly than we expect? So certainly on the investment side, that would be good news for us. Um, and we have a number of strategies that we've been uh, working on on the investment side to try to offset some of the, the uh, the challenges that we've got in terms of, of what we're earning on our investments. Um, on the debt side, it's something that we monitor very closely. Now, um, as to when it's going to come up is certainly a big question mark, when it may start to rise. Um, but I do, in terms of some of the research that we've done, the message seems to be it's not going to jump quickly. Um, and so I think certainly some of the dealings that we're having with Infrastructure Ontario, we are keeping an eye on that. Um, one of the things that I can share that, that uh, is of an advantage for us, particularly on our larger debt issuances, so our larger projects as, as in the utility projects as an example, um, because of the, the rating that we get from Standard & Poor's, while it has some effect on the actual interest rate that we're paying, um, it also provides other beneficial terms for us. So one of the things that we can do because of the rating that we get from them is we can basically pre-lock it in, we can pre-borrow. And a lot of municipalities cannot do that. So if we saw it going up and we didn't have the project finished yet, but we knew we were going to be spending the money, we could actually lock it in earlier. Um, and so we, we've got that, uh, that ability. So we've got a few things like that in terms of working with them, but it's certainly something with the levels of debt we have, we keep an eye on. The other thing I did mention is, is that's important too, is just um, in going out in terms of our planned debt and even the debt that we haven't yet issued, um, is we have a little higher rate in the models right now. So if it happens quicker and we can get it at three and a half, then we've got a little bit of leeway there as well. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so we have one uh, final presentation um, from Mr. Keach again. Now, 
Mr. Keach, I'm not going to tell you how long your first presentation was, but um, my stopwatch actually broke down. It was um, so. <laughs> I'm just hoping that um, we will manage our time effectively and uh, and allow time for questions uh, before we recess tonight. So. Thank you, and um, my staff pointed out to me that I talked 50 minutes, and for those of you who know me personally, for me to talk straight for 50 minutes, that's probably a lifetime record. Um, I do have a question, though. Since I probably, like, am going to win the award for the longest presentation, if this is the quickest, is that like a special <laughs> award? Or? So with that being said, um, this presentation, actually, I will be very quick, and um, as I noted at the start of the first one, there's quite a number of elements that I touched on um, in my, um, my first presentation uh, that was focused more on Utilities Kingston that overlap uh, with this presentation. A lot of the talk about the capital projects, uh, how the capital projects are picked and whatnot. So it's not my intention to go back into those. So I will uh, I'll keep this presentation um, pretty high level and, um, and as I said, uh, uh, quite quick. So first slide, um, I think it follows up from um, some of the conversations that Ms. Kennedy had. Looking at the overall operating budget increases for um, public works, uh, so our total is um, 30.6 million, roughly a variance of about half a million or under 2%, uh, which I think supports the, uh, the corporate goal. And um, obviously different, um, different levels there, but um, uh, you know, decreases in the engineering side and also in the uh, solid waste side. Uh, the engineering side, a lot to do with the LED streetlight program that was uh, just finished and uh, extremely successful. So uh, savings there from uh, energy purchases. In the solid waste side, um, savings in uh, a number of areas. Uh, Mr. Giles has uh, been able to um, uh, put some contracts out for uh, contractor services for waste disposal and whatnot that came back with some good prices. and. Uh, you know, a bit of the talk about the economy, how things go up and down. Uh, with solid waste, we do produce uh, a product from recycling that we sell on the market, and that fluctuates significantly. And um, uh, currently, and the projections going forward for the next year are quite positive. So uh, that has uh, that has assisted as well. The uh, capital budget, and um, obviously, I've talked a fair amount about this, blended in with the uh, the UK one, and. Uh, I just, I'm not going to repeat it, but I do want to stress that these, these budgets are extremely uh, integrated. The um, over, um, overall level of capital expenditures uh, for the departments is shown there. As I mentioned earlier, it adds up to about $140 million over the four years. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about solid waste and public works uh, because the, my focus was mainly on engineering. In solid waste, uh, one, one of the... Um, one of the items that we are dealing with is the emerald ash borer problem. Um, uh, I don't think so much in 2015, but the, uh, uh, the 16, 17, 18 years. Uh, we focus on uh, removal of trees that we're going to have to do, and also on, uh, on planting of trees uh, as well, dealing with that. And um, that's on the public works uh, side. On the solid waste, the, uh, the five million at the end mm -hmm. is for um, uh, looking at the um, um, MRF, uh, the Material Recovery Facility on um, Laffins Lane. And um, I'll, talk a little, well, I'll talk about this now. One of the items that we have in the operating uh, budget of solid waste is to, in conjunction with the province and some of the, uh, the, the partners that uh, are required to fund recycling, really looking at where the province is going from a recycling perspective. Um, are we going to uh, stay with um, um, municipal recycling facilities? Is it going to be regional or is it even going to be bigger than that? So we do have an allotment in here if, uh, if uh, Kingston moves along those lines. Um, so uh, talk about the, uh, the engineering group. And um, actually, I probably should um, uh, introduce uh, the staff here from uh, Public Works. So Mark Campbell is uh, here representing uh, engineering. And uh, he has Kim Brown, John Parana, and Deanna Green uh, with him uh, from the engineering side. 
Avon Wells uh, from Public Works is here on his own this evening, and uh, John Giles uh, with Solid Waste. And behind John is uh, Heather Roberts, who is here as well. And I just want to point out that uh, uh, Heather will actually be replacing John mid-year as, uh, as John uh, decides uh, to go off into retirement and do other things. So I just wanted to draw attention to uh, uh, Heather here as well. So um, engineering, uh, the operating budgets, I touched on the savings from the LED, the uh, street lights. Uh, from an operating perspective, uh, continue to uh, focus on asset management. Obviously a huge workload with the uh, four-year capital plan that we talked about. But, um, you know, if I go back, um, and again, I'm not, I'm being very careful not to repeat what I talked about uh, in the previous presentation, but the planning for the next four year plan and forward will basically start as we start in the construction of the current one. It, it never stops, it's an ongoing process, and, and, and that will, uh, will continue. Uh, the other area that um, the engineering group is, is very heavily devolved, is involved in is supporting other uh, other areas, and particularly uh, in the development review process uh, with Ms. Hurdle's group, um, um, the City Engineering, the UK Engineering, and Lanny's group, I think, work extremely well together um, in, in that regard um, and, and remains a focus of the uh, municipal engineering. This is a slide that uh, I showed you before. I'm not, not gonna touch on it, just to reiterate the principles that we talked about before apply here as well. Um, again, I uh, showed this, uh, this slide earlier. It looks at some of the areas that uh, we are uh, spending capital funds over the uh, four years. Uh, you know, traffic management, uh, talked a little bit about uh, road construction, reconstruction, bridges and culverts, uh, active transportation, a big area. And then some of the uh, key projects uh, develop, uh, funded by uh, development fees at the bottom. And as I said, it totals up to uh, about um, uh, 140 million. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects um, in particular and, and um, uh, go back and just mention a couple that we uh, talked about in the UK presentation. So the Princess Street project, again, I'm not going to repeat it, but a uh, major project from the engineering department's perspective as well as the UK. And I, I talked about the necessity for that the advantages uh, that will come as a result of that. So, exact same thing with the Young Street project. And again, just, just uh, putting these here to, uh, to draw the attention to council of the coordination between them. So this is a different slide. You did not see this in the UK, uh, UK presentation. It is focused on strictly roads. And it is looking at uh, annual infrastructure repair, uh, not major projects. Um, but um, I, I guess repair as needed uh, on a yearly basis. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, focused back on last winter, and I think um, with, with uh, some of the uh, snowfall events that we've had this year, people uh, went back very quickly to the snow that we had last year and, um, you know, the, the road conditions and whatnot that we were dealing with as a result of the, the ice storm, the snow, whatnot. Um, but I think the other part that people, uh, um, and in particular council, need to remember is the condition of the roads when the snow went away, uh, when the ice melted and we had potholes upon potholes. And uh, one of the things that we were quite proud of is how we dealt with this um, and uh, a very quick uh, analysis of all the roads, um, a prioritization of them, uh, working with um, uh, the city finance group, uh, the CAO, to get additional funding, and this was additional funding on, on top of the, uh, the money that we had in the uh, four-year plan, to go out and deal with uh, the very, very poor road conditions as a result of the winter last year. So one of the things that we have built into this plan, so it is, it is included in this plan, is an allotment, as it says at the bottom, it's about 1.2 million a year to do these types of projects, because um, we think it was quite successful and is something that we plan on continuing on um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, very well received by the public. Uh, the way we, we got prices and did the work was different. Um, it taxed a lot of different groups within the municipality, including uh, communications and whatnot, because uh, these, these, uh, these were projects that were identified quickly. Uh, we got prices on them quickly and we fixed them quickly. And uh, I think it was very successful and something we plan on moving forward uh, in, the, uh, in the next four years. 
Um, again, I touched on a number of, um, of uh, drivers for the uh, four-year plan, uh, more so on the, uh, the streets that were, that were combined projects. Um, uh, one of them, active transportation, traffic issues, just general asset management. Another driver is new roads, and I'm separating that a little bit from uh, the work uh, that we talked about with utilities, Kingston, um, in, in that it's, it's not rebuilding um, infrastructure, and not saying that for a number of these uh, we aren't putting in utility infrastructure at the same time, but um, drivers from these are more from the um, uh, transportation master plan, and that is a plan um, that basically, uh, and there's not a pun intended here, but provides a roadmap for what we need to do for new roads, rebuilt roads. Um, and when I say rebuilt roads, not just because of the infrastructure is in poor condition, but because you need to get more traffic through it or redo the intersections and whatnot. Um, this, this plan will be coming to council, I believe it's in March. Um, uh, for a detailed presentation because it's a very uh, important strategic tool for council in planning your road network on a go forward basis. And I say road network and, and I think if you if you take nothing more from my, my presentation tonight is a realization that the, that the, um, the road infrastructure is a network and it all ties together and it all flows together. My background is in electricity and there's a lot of networks that's involved in that. And it's interesting, you would not believe it, but the parallels between how a transportation system works and a fairly complex electrical system, uh, system can work. So there will be a detailed presentation to council on the transportation master plan. And coming out of that will be information that will help council make decisions, key st strategic decisions for a go forward basis on a couple of other projects that are not in the budget tonight. We're not talking about them tonight. And they are the Wellington Street extension and the third crossing. And hence when the, the question for the bridge came up, I just wanted to make sure that we were talking about the John Connor Boulevard project because that was in uh, the budget that is presented tonight because that was a direction that was provided from the last council for staff to continue working on. Um, these are different, uh, you know, Good, uh, good information from the transportation, transportation master plan that will feed into this, feed into your discussions at the strategic planning session and help make decisions in regards to these two key projects on a go forward basis. Um, a couple of other new uh, roads programs, so, and I, I may have touched on these briefly um, in, uh, in my other presentation. Um, actually, I did this one because um, uh, although it's, it's new roads or um, you know, rehabilitated roads for more traffic. I also mentioned for the Highway 2 project that we are putting a, um, a new uh, or, or a uh, paralleled uh, sewer main. Uh, so, um, you know, a, a traffic project, but also again being coordinated uh, with, uh, with the utilities. This to obviously um, um, provide capacity uh, for uh, traffic on a go forward basis and uh, coming from, uh, from transportation master plans as well. Um, and the other one, and I'm just going to mention it, is the John Connor Boulevard uh, project that was talked about uh, and, and some questions answered. Uh, key project, uh, particularly from a financial perspective, it's, I think it's in the 60, 65 million dollar uh, range for this project over the four year capital budget. So um, uh, that's I, the only comments that I'm trying to be aware of time. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the roads projects. At everybody's um, seat today, I believe there was maps that provides information in regards to the four years in different categories from roads to active transportation um, and, and other areas. Um, switching to public works, so, so uh, Damon's area, um, you know, from an operating budget perspective, uh, it is up 3.6%. Um, uh, a uh, couple of the drivers here, um, is in regards to, or one of the drivers is in regards to the uh, the final item here, focus on winter control. There's $100,000 in here to um, help us uh, take a very hard look at uh, how we manage winter control. One of the things that we want to do is an update to the uh, winter control plan that looks at the routes um, and, and uh, the number of routes and how we go about that. Um, some of the other areas that um, we are looking at is um, and continue to look at, and again, um, I, I think all these we've been very successful in the last little while, cleanliness and maintenance of downtown, and that's done for a couple of reasons. One, because it is, um, you know, the downtown uh, core of the city. 
we've done a lot of capital improvements there. We want to make sure that um, um, they uh, they are uh, continued to kept uh, basically kept in shape, kept up to par, and the uh, supports the special events that take place. A lot of work with the BIA merchants and uh, other players there as well. Um, also to support uh, demands for increased service. So. As you build roads, John Turner Boulevard, the work in the past is a, an excellent, um, I think, representation. It was a two-lane highway. Now, you know, some places there's six lanes there. Uh, the cycling lanes, as we, uh, and I talked about this, I think how proud we are that we've gone from a municipality that was viewed not supporting active transportation, one that is very clearly supporting it, but it comes with maintenance issues. And, you know, you look at winter control, and it's not just roads, but you also get the comments with uh, bike paths uh, and clearing of bike paths. So, and then a couple of other examples there. But again, uh, focus on winter control. There, I, I don't have a slide on this, um, but in the package in detail, there was some um, information that was requested at EITP comparing um, um, service levels now to where it was, I think, back in 2008. We've tried to provide some detailed information in that regard to answer that question. Um, and as I said, this is an area that we will uh, continue to focus on. Um, and uh, the comment about pinch points. As you look out, um, we do feel that we're going to have to add resources to this uh, in future years. And there, uh, there is money budgeted in, um, I think, 16 and 17 uh, for that, for winter control. But then again, not just for winter control, because those people in the summertime will be used for parks um, um, and uh, other uh, issues that public works uh, maintains. If I uh, look at solid waste in the, um, from the operating budget, the, the timing of this is actually uh, pretty good, because at the EITP committee meeting of last week, we presented a report that um, Looked at to date where the uh, city of Kingston has been in reaching its waste diversion targets. And uh, we talked about a report that's coming forward at the next committee meeting that will help establish or reaffirm targets. And then also with uh, a number of uh, items that uh, council can choose to um, adopt to help us reach that. Um, ongoing expansion of the green bin program, basically just making green bins available to uh, multi-residential as we continue to roll it out. Um, the regional material facilities I discussed, and I think as we look at um, other ways of, um, of uh, increasing diversion, we also need to look at ways of saving costs, and the two may work in parallel. And that is my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, first of all, just a quick question regarding um, the next big dig yep. on Princess Street. At the completion of that, will we have uh, renewed capacity or will there be one more dig required after that before we're able to lift the freeze in Williamsville and that end of uh, at Division and Princess? So that's, um, that's not... That's a multi-answered question, which I will do. It's just, it's not a, that's oh, not a yes or okay. no. So if you just bear with me. So I will. <laughs> my quick responses is going to diverge here for a minute. Um, the project that we are proposing, I need to be very clear that we are proposing, and we are still in discussions with the BIA as to how this will roll out. We'll go from Bagot to Barry, So longer stretch. And... We believe that it will provide capacity probably up to Division Street. Um, will it provide the capacity for kind of Division to University, I think, to Alfred and sort of that sort of no man's land that, that at least I, 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 I phrase it as that because there's a huge capacity constraints there. At this point, I'm not sure it's, it's going to help it um, with, without a doubt, but to get there, we're going to have to to do this project and, and kind of what we're saying is, you know, if you go a block at a time, you're going to be 10 years before you get there. I appreciate that. That's great. A um, couple of questions based on your capital budget summary. Um, I noticed that Emerald Ashbor has $900,000 from 216 to 218, but nothing in the next year. Um, is there a reason why uh, because clearly the problem 
is here and is persistent. Is is there any reason why it's being delayed a year? Um, I think, and Damon may want to supplement this. Um, uh, I think our feeling is we we at some point we want to be proactive in removing trees, but we also want uh, residents to be very aware that we need to do this so we don't start taking down live trees and a lot of questions as to why we're doing it. I believe there may be um, uh, some a small amount of funds that are being carried forward from last year into next year, but uh, yeah, so that's the, basically the answer. So there'll be some program this year, but more money devoted in the coming years? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, yes, there's, a, there's actually a significant amount of money being carried forward from last year. Last year, our, our efforts around the Emerald Ash Borer um, revolved around uh, developing the uh, cost mitigation strategy, and uh, which was presented to EITP in December, I believe. So uh, we're actually only more going to get into implementing that strategy this year with uh, funds that were allocated from to last year. And um, I want to thank I should have asked you that question on the email today, but I want to thank you for your response. Uh, the uh, plows, both sidewalk and street equipment that we're purchasing, my concern was uh, whether we had adequate staff, and I understand we're down some staff, but you're looking to, f to fill those positions shortly. Is that accurate? Again, through you, Your Worship. We are short-staffed. Um, over the last uh, several years, we've had, uh, each year, we, to back up a bit, each year we, we bring on 20 additional part-time staff to assist with winter control duties. Over the last five or six years, we've started to um, have a hard time to find qualified staff to bring on. Um, as you can imagine, uh, driving a plow truck in a, in a snowstorm at night with a, a wing out behind you takes a fair bit of skill. and. Um, it's a, a big piece of equipment. You're out there uh, often amongst traffic, and we have to ensure that our staff are, are well qualified to undertake that task. We're having a very hard time finding those qualified individuals with that experience, so we're going to have to look at other options on how we can fulfill our staffing needs. Uh, we're working on some of those right now, and we think that the uh, also the review that will be done this uh, this year will help us determine what our real staffing needs are as far as routes and equipment and everything like that goes. So we're, we want to make sure we, we kind of get our, our ducks in order and figure out different options for acquiring additional staff uh, before we go fully ahead. Thank you. Um, a qu a qu first of all, I, I want to applaud having a budget line for active transportation. I know in the past we didn't have that dedicated budget line. And so every initiative that council took, you were kind of scrambling to find money from other budget lines to complete that. So I think that's excellent. Uh, bridges and culverts. I know we've inherited a number of these in the rural area uh, from the province. Uh, are these forecast capital expenditures adequate for us to keep those maintained because I've heard some horror stories in other in other uh, municipalities around some of those inherited bridges and culverts. So, so I would say yes. Um, one of the, you know, as part of asset management, one of the things that we do is look at the condition of these. Um, uh, you know, particularly with bridges, we've had some fairly significant projects that we have undertaken rehabilitation of over the last number of uh, of years and. One that um, was, was started and will continue um, uh, out by the Invista plant. Um, you know, it's something that we, we continue to monitor. We realize um, um, the risk and that associated with them. And, you know, it's an area that if, if, we, if we felt from a risk perspective needed to be dealt with, uh, we, we would be uh, providing additional uh, requests, sorry, for additional funds here. And, and the only thing within engineering that I wondered about whether we're putting enough money in, is traffic calming measures. Uh, any of the incumbents will know that that's one of the most, uh, I mean, lots, we get lots of calls about traffic calming. And, uh, and I'm wondering whether 
80,000 in 2015, and then gradual increase would be adequate for us to meet the kind of demands that we may be getting from our, our community. Hey, um, I, I guess the answer to that is, is sort of along the lines of a, of a, a number of projects. We've, we've tried to come forward with a number um, that you know fits within the budget that we have that we think will address this. Uh, traffic calming, like active transportation and some other, other uh, items, also get included in rehabilitation projects and whatnot. Um, I, I guess our feeling is that uh, it, it's a good balance, um, and that's that's the uh, proposal we've we've brought forward. So. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't look convinced. I know, but it's we field a lot of calls about it. Um, lastly, on solid waste, just very quickly, I sent Mr. Giles, and thank you for your prompt response a question regard, regarding the recycling depots for public areas, because there's two within this budget. But as I understand your response, there's one that's already been paid for that will probably be planted somewhere this year, and then that there'll be two or three more that will bring on stream in the, in the next couple of years? To you, Your Worship, uh, we have two in the WIP, the work in progress, that will be actually placed in 15, 2015. And then the capital has two more every second year starting in 16. Excellent, thank you very much. Now we all will scramble and lobby to have them in our districts, but that's good. <laughs> thank you very much. Any other questions? Councillor McLaren. Thank you. May I ask the engineering development funded department here, or group, are they 100% development charge funded or is there a tax component or a debt component? So they're not 100% they're not development funded. Um, some of the work that they would do would be paid uh, for by um, uh, development charges from the project. Um, the, there would be, um, so if, if I talk the engineering group as a whole, uh, not just, so that there's, um, there's, there's people in the engineering group that work on development issues, but they may work on other issues as well. Um, so I, I don't, there's not, a, there's not really a clear uh, development department in the engineering, so it's, although there are people that focus on that. People in the engineering department that would work on capital projects, such as the John Counter Boulevard project, would charge some time to that, um, and then the overall project would be uh, funded from um, some from development charges, some from taxes, and some of that would be from debt. So it's a bit of a complex answer, I realize. So in the case of the John Counter widening, about how much is development charges, how much is debt, and how much is taxes? So I, I so think... I'm sorry, I thought you were asking something. I, I think it's about half and half development charges and taxes. As far as, so then for the taxes, there would be a debt portion of it, and development charges, there would be a debt portion of it. And I, don't, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I'm not sure if the treasurer might be able to. Ms. Kennedy. Through your worship, I'm just quickly looking it up here. Um, so we have done uh, uh, debt for the John Counter Boulevard widening. Um, we actually have two components. There was um, a bit of debt, I believe. No, I'm lying to you, there wasn't. Um, there was just the municipal capital, so just the uh, municipal portion, not the development charge portion. Um, we funded about 13 million from debt. Thank you. And if I may ask, what does CWD stand for under about fourth one down? It says CWD new two lane road, Sydenham to 560 M meters, I assume, east phase one EA land. Yes, that's Cat Woods Drive. Cat Woods Drive. Through, through you, Your Worship, uh, that will be Cat Woods Drive between uh, Sydenham and Centennial. Any other questions? Councillor Hutchison. 
Um, I just want to emphasize uh, something Councillor Neal said, that I think the traffic calming number is way low. It's down around where it was when I came on Council. No, it was 40,000 then. So it's twice as much as them, but considerably lower than uh, I think is necessary. Otherwise, what happens is districts are competing in each other and you're not getting anything, some years. And the one thing that people say to me is, my kids are gonna be grown up or they're gonna be dead before we get this traffic calming. And the process is so long. And of course, part of the reasons it's long is because there's relatively little capital for staff to utilize. And um, so if something could be done about that, I think uh, the people in neighborhoods, the average citizen would probably be happier. Some will be very unhappy, I recognize that. But many will be happy. And um, <clears throat> I have another question. I just, uh, this is just pro forma. And, um, and that is sometimes when you're doing these uh, budgets, you just ask questions and make darn good and sure that this is gonna happen. <laughs> And that is the revamped cleanliness and maintenance program downtown is definitely going forward, right? And we're gonna do it. We've kind of started in a way. I think. It started and it will definitely continue. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanna know, thank you. Just a, as a follow-up question to Councilor Hutchinson's first comment, I seem to recall that there was an issue in the last council of actually not being able to spend the money on traffic calming because um, there just wasn't enough buy-in from the residents. So. Is, is there actually money that's already been accumulated from previous years on that? Does anyone know that? Ms. Green. Through you, Your Worship, yes, there are some funds that we weren't, were unable to spend for the reasons that you mentioned, that in past years where we had a voting system within our traffic calming policy, we often did not get buy-in for the projects that we took out to the residents. But with the new policy that Council approved last year, we no longer have a voting process. So uh, in 2014, we were able to get support for five out of our seven projects. So we do expect uh, with the new policy in place that we will get support for more streets in the future. Well, that's fine. I think it's just a matter of making sure we spend the money that has already been accumulated and then perhaps we can look at accumulating more. So, thank you. Other questions? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, uh, just a few quick questions. Um, the exploration of a materials recovery facility, um, I just, I wanted to explore that uh, briefly a little more in depth. I'm not completely sure what a materials recovery facility is. And is that, um, is there a potential of that becoming revenue generating or revenue creation, if that's what I think it is? So the, what it is is basically the recycling depot on, on Lapham's Lane where the recycling trucks come in and it gets separated out and we bail things and send them off and get money for them. So um, that's in, in quick terms. And if any of council is interested in coming out and seeing it and having a tour, um, John or Heather would be, be pleased to, uh, to, to make that happen. Um, we currently um, do sell materials and we, we get money from the sale of the materials. and. Uh, Depending on the markets, uh, price of aluminum, glass, whatnot, it, it goes it goes up and down. Um, one of the things that we have seen, and this is probably no surprise, is the amount of um, newsprint that comes in has down drastically. So that has that has uh, impacted the uh, the revenue down. Um, the, uh, the the sort of where this is going to go depends a lot on the province, and I may get John uh, just to, to to talk a little bit about the players in this and their role. Um, but um, there are uh, people, um, so manufacturers who are responsible for the materials that ends up being recycled have to pay a portion of it. And I think the province is making them pay more. So they wanna have more of a say in how their money is being spent. So as a result of that, there are different groups looking at where recycling facilities are going to go in the future and are they gonna stick with the municipal ones or are they gonna to go to regional ones or are they gonna to go to 
huge regional ones. Um, and over the next couple of years, there are gonna be some decisions made on that. We currently have a study underway right now looking at that. And I don't, John, do you wanna to add to the, my comments in case I missed something? I'll just expand through you, Your Worship, a little bit. Um, the, we have a Waste Reduction Act in the province, and the new government has committed to bring out a new Waste Reduction Act this year, we think. <laughs> they said they, they haven't actually committed, but we expect to get a Waste Reduction Act later this year. And um, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change um, can bring out a regulation requiring um, any material to be managed by the stewards of the material, whether it's electronic waste or tires, recycling, organic waste. And currently, the, um, the existing regs require the stewards to pay up to 50%, but uh, we don't really get 50% because there's some other rules in there. But municipalities are expecting that the new regs are going to be much higher and possibly up to 100%. So if they do go to 100%, then the stewards are going to have much more of a say as to uh, where the money is spent, and that's what Jim was referring to. We are currently... Uh, doing a council approved 50% funded through Waste Diversion Ontario study to look at Kingston being a regional MRF. Um, right now we're quasi-regional. We do Loyalist Townships and South Frontenac's processing. We're looking at expanding that area. However, we, until we know exactly how much funding uh, the government is going to require the stewards to contribute, we don't really know what the outcome of, or what our recommendation will be. So we're just waiting for that right now, and there will be a report coming through EITP to Council in that regard later this spring. Great, thank you. Um, that was more complex than I anticipated. Um, I, an, another quick question, and uh, this is more uh, for public works than uh, solid waste. Um, I'm just, we, we, we've been asked to approve the capital expenditure for some more equipment uh, so that we have more equipment than there are routes. But you mentioned earlier to um, Councillor Neal that we are having some uh, staffing issues. Uh, and when I kind of look at this chart on page 17 here, I have a hard time matching enough staff per shift to equipment that we already have. Um, and I know that trucks go down and we wanna have a spare and that is pretty good, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned if we don't solve the staffing issue, um, we're gonna have more trucks sitting around not plowing things uh, and routes that are already quite long going. And I know you're looking into all of that, but I'm, I'm worried that we're getting ahead of ourselves by purchasing this equipment before we take a look at the winter control plan so or agreeing to purchase this equipment before that so if you would just speak to that briefly that would be great so i'll take a stab at this and again damon may want to to add to it so so again um the main reason we're adding the equipment is spares for breakdown um so and i think the i mean i think that's evident with the snowblower we have one snowblower so i don't think there's a question with that um, with the snow plow and I think particularly the sidewalk plows, I, I can understand the concern and particularly as Damon said, unfortunately the difficulty of attracting um, the skilled part-time drivers that we seem to used to be able to, that, that, is causing us, uh, that is causing us an issue. The equipment that we're purchasing here will go into the budget, will be purchased. I'm not sure when we're getting it delivered, but uh, you know, this, it would be nice to get the snow blower soon. Some of it may not be till next year. Uh, we are going to look at a lot of this, and we do have money in for next year, as I said, for uh, probably staffing. So I think at that point in time, this will be solved. I, I understand the concern. We, we are also looking at um, maybe some different ways within public works, uh, uh, some um, um, 
some work that they've been doing with the engineering group and some staff of maybe making some people available for the sidewalk plows that, um, I mean, it, it's still a, uh, a skilled job, but maybe not the same as how Damon de uh, described driving the snow plow. So it, it's a valid comment, but I think at this point uh, we're comfortable with it, um, but it, it will need to be addressed when we're standing here next year. Thank you, that's, um, uh, that's fantastic. I just, uh, just want, it's, Looking down the line at future, uh, the projected tax increases, I'm just worried about making expenditures that would increase that. Um, and I, it's important that we try to hold the line because, as as everyone at this table knows, having run a campaign, cost of living is going up, and we're we're doing our best. And I applaud everything that we've done uh, across our departments to be efficient, but it's. Uh, I just want us to make sure we're being cognizant and not putting carts before horses. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else that has a question? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Keach. Thanks uh, to Council both uh, for the support on UK and uh, Public Works, appreciate it. Thank you. So that uh, brings us to the end of our agenda for tonight. We have no communications. Uh, we do have a very full night tomorrow though, so we will take right, uh, Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion to recess or if we, can I have a motion to recess? Move by Councillor George, second by Councillor Neal. Please vote. And that carries, we'll see you tomorrow at six.